uh, hello everyone. Uh, we are doing a uh, different type of panel than we usually do, a special panel. Um, like, as I was saying previously, put together by a good friend, Katarana. Um, it's a panel on neural divergency. Um, and I have some feedback, a little bit of feedback going on. I don't know what that is. Um, where, is where is that coming from? Um, one second. Uh, eat Marcy? Some, yeah. What's that? I think it's a little audio thing that was coming from me. I don't know what that was. Um, oh. In the Discord? Well, yeah, it sounds fine now. Yeah, it's fine uh -huh. now. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, hey, uh, Sunny. Um, yeah, don't turn your camera there. Click on that link that's in the group DM. Yeah, Marcy, it's back. I don't know what that is. It's like a, I don't know, like a quartz knot already plugged in completely. What's happening? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. All right. Is that fixed? Yeah. Um, yeah, now it's good. All right, so. Ah, uh, here we go. Um, great. So we're getting started. Hey everyone. Um, um, oh, it's. It, all right, we're gonna work on that, Marcy. Uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> I could get. I yeah, don't know what's happening. Yeah, maybe uh, mute for now. Um, and then just like okay. unmute later on. All right, try it again one more time. <laughs> Hello everyone. Uh, we're doing a neurodivergent panel. Um, we got a great group of guys. who are joining us. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, get started. All right. Um. I will start with uh, Katarana, Katarana uh, who helped us put this together. Amazing uh, human being, amazing uh, person who's jumped into my community and tried to literally help us expand on what we do. Um, so uh, thank you for being here, Katarana. I just go wherever work is. I saw the work, so I have a life when I can hang out here. Uh, <laughs> since it's a neurodivergency panel, I'll make sure I go ahead and introduce myself in terms of neurodivergency as well. So hello, I'm Katarana, I'm a physicist, um, and yeah, I'm here all the time. And in terms of uh, neurodivergencies, I have um, ADHD, OCD, depression, um, alexithemia, PTSD, autism, and narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah, so thanks for letting me come here and uh, yeah, I am excited about the whole idea of uh, going ahead and destigmatizing and just having, you know, an uh, open discussion about all of these different things rather than letting uh, lovely TV sh uh, shows and movies such as music by Sia tell people what autism is like. Yay. Hey, okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, next, we have a uh, Montreal player. Uh, oh, Montreal. Oh. Thanks for uh, coming back, um, being part of you, coming into our uh, open panels previously. Uh, tell us about yourself. Yeah, thanks for the thanks for the invite. Uh, my name is Montreal Player. You can call me Monty. Um, I in December I'm 40 years old. Have four kids. Uh, in December I was diagnosed with severe ADHD. I've been dealing with this all my life. Uh, I um, I found out about it. Uh, I have um, two daughters also diagnosed. Uh, one with uh, one with also ADD um, or ADHD inattentive profile because it's changed now um, and uh, dyslexia, dysorthographia, and dyscalculia. Um, bright girl is just all the stuff that school asks you to do is incredibly difficult for her. Um, and that's it. I have another daughter, uh, and this is how I found out. Uh, I have another daughter who um, uh, ADHD inattentive profile, um, high IQ. Uh, OCD, um, d uh, depression, uh, a lot of um, cognitive distortions, uh, just uh, things like that. Uh, I'm not going to go through the list because I don't actually know the whole list, but I know her personality. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, that's it. Uh, so it kind of runs in the family, and uh, I guess we're all kind of discovering um, this. Uh, I've been dealing with it, again, all my life, and, and it's funny to see how, <laughs> how many, I guess, adaptations uh, have been made. Things that you thought were your personality uh, or you thought were unique to your personality or actually just coping mechanisms for dealing with some stuff you're, you have going on in your brain. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, that's it for now. Well, I guess we'll talk later. Yeah, and I'm not just back. I'm better than ever because I get to stream. I'm a streamer now, and like, it's it just feels like wow. I'm <laughs> excuse me. I'm finally here, and 
Yeah, so I, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I, as far as I like, as far as I've been diagnosed, I feel like I have other stuff going on, uh, like schizotypal disorder. But as far as I've been diagnosed, um, uh, I have high functioning autism. Um, I wasn't diagnosed until late in life. Uh, I went through a lot of my life going through behavioral schools and stuff like that, uh, being treated for just being a bad kid, I guess. Um, was put on a lot of meds that did not help the situation at all. If anything, they probably made it harder for me to deal with the, uh, what the autism was doing for me. And, um, yeah, so, uh, I'm just, I'm so happy to be here and be able to talk about this. I don't know what else to say. Okay. Um, uh, and I, I said, had said nice things about, um, Ninetales just now. I was muted, um, to my, to my audience, um, because I was trying to protect you from background noise, but then I protected you from my voice. So, uh, I was saying great things about Ninetales, wonderful, amazing things, poetic things, but I guess you'll never know what, what I said. All right. <laughs> Moving <best>. on. <laughs> um, and next, uh, we have Marcy. Marcy, uh, thanks for stopping, uh, by, uh, once again, um, and joining us. Please tell the world about yourself. Prime, I'm always happy to be on your panels, even if you are a dry, dry boy. All right. Uh, are you still getting background noise from me? I know. We're good. Cool. My mic was turned up, like, unreasonably high on my computer, and I have no idea why. So we fixed that. All right. Cool. Mm. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Girlboss Marcy. Uh, I stream on Twitch. I, I stream, like, politics, music, uh, just hanging out with my chat, play video games sometimes. I've been speedrunning Zelda games. That's that's a good time. You know, we love to see it. Um in terms of neurodivergencies, I have ADHD and I have uh, like a really, really severe uh, general anxiety disorder. And I also have uh, even more severe uh, health anxiety disorder, which used to be called hypochondria. I, uh, I would have been called a hypochondriac a long time ago, like in the 90s. I still call myself that, um, but I, it's like a stigmatizing term, apparently. So it's not really used anymore, which I, I mean is probably for the better. That's just always how I heard it growing up. But uh, I experience like psychosomatic symptoms of whatever diseases I'm afraid of at the moment. Uh, I <laughs> earlier in the pandemic uh, had like COVID for like a week. Uh, I had COVID symptoms, you know, and I was like experiencing like the fever. Like I literally had a fever and I was like crazy, like psyched out about it. Um, and then I, my test results came back finally and they were like, oh, you don't have COVID. And within 30 minutes, all the symptoms went away. Literally everything my body was experiencing was just like gone in 30 fucking minutes. Um, and that's when I realized I have a problem. But like all throughout high school, like when Ebola was like a big concern in 2015, I was terrified of Ebola. And I, I, every time I'd have to like go to the bathroom, I'd be like, oh God, I have Ebola. And then it was like, I took a health class and we talked about like botulism and E. coli. And I was scared of that stuff. And so then I had the, like foodborne illnesses. So, you know, it's been a, it's been an upward hill, but we're, we're, we're getting better. And I'm, I'm glad to be here and talk about some maybe fringe neurodivergencies. Thanks so much. Uh, next, we have a very famous person, Demon Mama, back at it. Demon Mama, thank you for coming through. Um, thank you for being here previously for that uh, for the other panel, the IP um, vaccine uh, panel. Um, yeah, thanks for spending time with my community once again. Absolutely, very very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Demon Mama. For those you don't, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am a political edutainer uh, on uh, YouTube and Twitch and do a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, I'm here um, because uh, I have a ADHD and borderline personality disorder, and I've also dealt with um, lifelong uh, clinical depression. So I've, uh, I like to think I have some insights and some thoughts on uh, issues related to neuroatypical and neurodivergent people um, and my own experiences with it. So yeah, um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy this panel got brought together. I think these are really important issues that don't really get talked about um frequently enough in my opinion so uh thank you for having me and uh look forward to talking with you all okay um and last but absolutely not least we have sunny um goes by another name but i wouldn't know what that is um sunny uh who has uh, also jumped head first into the community and uh very uh, excited to have her here um i was unaware you were uh neurodivergent um so please educate us and uh the rest of the audience on um yeah, why'd you like what? Why'd you decide to join? Hi everyone. Uh, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. 
Uh, I'm Ugly Pie. You can also call me Sunny if you refuse to call me ugly. <laughs> um, but I, I'm super honored to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm both a medical sociology student and public health student seeking, um, hopefully going into grad school for public health or health sociology. And I've also uh, have been uh, have been diagnosed for about a year, but have been, uh, you know, living the life for about 10, perhaps, uh, 12, perhaps. Um, I have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, um, depression, anxiety, uh, and as well as anorexia nervosa, which I am currently in recovery for. Um, as well as uh, like ADHD, like PTSD, but it, that one gets a little bungled up with BPD. And so, yeah, that's, and so I'm, I'm really excited to bring, you know, that's the, that side on. Okay. Well, thank you so much. All right. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, and if you're watching this on YouTube, um, then do me a favor, hit uh, subscribe if you haven't done so already, uh, like and comment, um, comment about, um, uh, uh would you like to call sunny either sunny or uh ugly come on you, you know the correct answer right like let's... <laughs> all right any which way um katarana uh would you be so kind as to uh read uh the first topic uh for us read oh hell yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay cool so first question some neurodivergencies are codified and seen as infantile, such as Down syndrome and autism, while some are vilified, such as narcissistic personality disorder. Is this fair to do? Are there any neurodivergencies that have associations that are given to them that you believe are fair? Should we stop using these terms to refer to behaviors that neurotypicals have, such as XY is such a narcissist, this is giving me PTSD, I'm very OCD about ABC. Um, and yeah, I just, uh, these are all things that I think about all the time. Uh, as somebody with narcissistic personality disorder, quite often I'll hear uh, people use the word, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure this person has narcissistic personality disorder. You know, people that have absolutely no formal qualifications to go ahead and say that, or, you know, just calling people narcissist, uh, saying like, yeah, uh, <laughs> I like, I'm really OCD about making up my bed. And it's like, that's cute. Uh, OCD actually like takes up six hours of my day every day, but I'm, I'm happy making up your bed is really fun. Um, yeah, so yeah, I just thought that would be a good question to get started with. Okay, uh, Montreal player. Yeah, um, I don't, uh, okay. When when I hear these terms, at least about anything that, that directly involves me, uh, it doesn't affect me. I mean, that much. I don't. I don't think about it uh, that much. Uh, I just. Uh, I guess the only time I would feel I would take offense or something is I feel like someone's profiting off off that designation, if you can in any way, right? Uh, because you know, at the end of the day, this thing has kind of caused a lot of tears. You know, it, it's caused a lot of pain in your life, and uh, and and those things aren't nothing. And you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna take the credit for for having a condition like this, then I I would I would like you to at least you know have paid the cost, which which comes in the form of of you know uh, a lot of hard times, depression, difficulty managing relationships, stuff like that. You didn't suffer through that, then then don't take the credit for it. That's the only time I guess it would it would irk me to to hear something like that. But I mean, as far as just like a casual a casual like mention of it maybe maybe it's because i don't feel part of the neurodivergent crew you know long enough right now but um but for me it's it doesn't um it doesn't trip the cringe sensor if that makes any sense right uh personally uh the other thing no that's it um the only the only thing in terms of just like a casual, I guess, depictions of like behaviors, it made me think of, honestly, it made me think of sometimes you see characters in movies or even books, right? And they have weird characteristics, right? But 
but you've learned about these things and, and you realize, ah, oh, you know, oh, I wonder if this person has, you know, uh, this condition that I've heard of, but these books are like from the 18th century or, or, or whatever they're, they're old books before any of these designations ever existed. Right. So I wonder if, if these characters are based on real characters, if those, if the pe real people they were based on had these conditions, right? Because I swear some characters before these things were even a thing, right? really seem to then they're fictional characters but they really seem to to have you know uh personality quirks that that are really in line with certain diagnoses that you may or may not have heard of uh i don't know if that that strikes a chord with anybody thank you so much next nine tails uh muted uh following my footsteps great work yeah in pro streamer mode right mm -hmm. um so, yeah, um, this is a hard one for me because I don't put as much responsibility on people. I put some, but not as much as I do on professionals. So when it comes to people, uh, I think that, like, look at the term stupid, for example. Like, if you're calling someone stupid, I might have an issue with that. And because, you know, what if they do have a learning disability or something like that? But you can obviously say something is stupid without invoking that particular problem. On the other hand, people will often use things like gaslighting to describe when uh, someone's just trying to tell them that they're wrong or when they're being lied to. And that's so incredibly false. And I think that that does do damage uh, for like, for example, abuse victims trying to describe what they've been through. Uh, people hear, oh, I was gaslit. And they think, oh, well, you're just lied to and told that you were wrong about things. So yeah, everyone's been through that. Uh, welcome to Twitch politics. Um, but, but that's not what uh, someone who's been through gaslighting and abusive relationship goes through. So uh, I think it's important that we ask ourselves how much equivocating we're doing with these things and how like generalize how much generalizing we're doing. As far as like professionals and psychiatrists and stuff like that, 100 percent like uh, any like prejudice or biases or like colloquial talk about these sort of things, is, it's just not going to be conducive to the professional environment and the sort of communication that professional needs to accurately describe these things. Um, although I'm sure they're much more careful with things and it's a little bit weird if you go up to a psychiatrist and say, oh, I was gaslit by my chat on Twitch or something like that. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I think like a lot of studies show that like uh, professionals can sell biases and stuff like that. And uh, I certainly think that these things can reinforce these uh, subconscious biases. Thanks so much. Marcy. Right. So uh, I forgot to say this. It seems like relevant information, but I forgot to say this during my intro. Uh, I used to be a music major and due to a complicated series of factors, I am switching to um, either social work or psychology, depending on where I end up um, at my current university or one with a social work major. Um, and I want to donate, I want to, I want to dedicate a lot of my time uh, after college to kind of eradicating these myths um, of like pop psychology, right? Because I feel like media has gone and, and I, I love me some media, right? I, I do. I love psycho. I love all these, these things that are kind of problematic, you know, but like media has this tendency to water down complicated concepts into like very easily graspable, understandable things, right? So we hear about something like, I don't know, uh, ASPD, right? And we see a character like Patrick Bateman or, uh, you know, one of these other characters and uh, they're, they're described as like a sociopath. And so sociopath becomes like when you don't have feelings, right? So now when people are in their interpersonal lives and arguments and they feel like someone's not being empathetic to them, they're going to be like, wow, you sociopath, right? And so we, we've developed this like lexicon of terms that used to actually refer to like conditions that people would have and now colloquially they kind of just mean like one trait you know like you could say depression and people just think sad you know you could say down syndrome or autism and people think stupid which is really unfortunate because that does a lot of harm to the people that are actually in those communities right um whether it's people being infantilized or people being vilified uh you talked about narcissistic personality disorder the amount of times i've seen like people on social media, uh, especially like big influencers or whatever, with a lot of young impressionable audiences, call each other narcissists and gaslighters and be like, narcissism is when you are like obsessed with yourself and you're like a fake friend. Uh, and it's like, that shit's so, so harmful. Um, you know, nobody will seek help if they are villainized. Nobody will seek help uh, or, or 
uh, betterment for their suffering in any way if they're treated as like monsters by the media and the world around them. So I think we need to work on that as a society. Um, that's that's like it. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, next, Steven Mama. Yeah. Um, so we've got sort of two different issues here. We've got first off the one of um, sort of stereotypes, positive or negative. Um, I don't think, uh, and I think part of the question was like whether some of these are like accurate or deserved. I don't think so. I don't think they're helpful at all. Um, and in fact, I think that they can even lead to a sort of blowback into um, messing with uh, like science. Um, for example, I mean, I, I have a diagnosis for borderline personality disorder, uh, a disorder which was at, w at one point very, very recently considered a so-called lost cause. And there were literally uh, psychiatrists and psychologists who would refuse to treat people with borderline personality disorder, which to me is just unbelievable. Like, I mean, especially since I've seen a such a, like I exper have personally experienced such a change since coming to understand how it functions and what to watch out for. My life has changed completely. And, and it's in my opinion, very manageable. Um, as long as you're not told that you've, you've received like a death sentence or something, it's pretty messed up. And there are a lot of people who act like that even online. Um, in fact, like I have been incredibly nervous about bringing up my diagnosis for not for ADHD, but for BPD, especially because I have already seen people in very large threads about me um, talking about, oh yeah, this like borderline bitch is just like, she's obviously like crazy and shit. Like I get that a lot. So I feel like, um, I feel like bringing it up sometimes is is like putting a target on my back um, because of how stigmatized it still is to this day. Um, and because if you go on Google and you search about borderline personality disorder, you will see a whole bunch of articles about uh, like the de the devil's disease that like robs your children and basically, you know, it's horrible. It's just absolutely terrible. Um, so I think that those sorts of things are completely are like like an absolute societal detriment. Now, with regard to like colloquializations of things like, oh, I'm so OCD or or wow, that's you know, triggering me or, or these sorts of things. I think a certain amount of that is inevitable, but I do think that we should be very cautious about those things because they can lead to like really bad misinformation. And I think they're sort of the first building block into building negative stereotypes. While I don't think they're always necessarily 100% harmful and there is absolutely a sort of um, societal spectrum for these things. Like for example, I would argue that like calling someone like an idiot has a very different connotation than using the R slur against somebody. Um, be just, it's just a societal context. Even though the roots of the word are not that far apart, the way they've become used over time does diverge. So I think it's it's a much more, uh, there's a lot more nuance in the conversation of like how these terms become colloquialized carelessly or otherwise. Um, but I don't, I don't really think it's to the same degree of seriousness as like these stereotypes that go around. Um, it, and and to talk to Marcy's point real quick about media, um, there's actually an amazing video that I wanted to shout out about um, borderline personality disorder um, in media. That's by um, I think it's called I think it's just called B BPD um, by Curio, um, who's a really amazing um, uh, content creator. And that video was ma was really important to me. So if you're somebody who um, like is, is struggling with representation, I would highly recommend that video because it's one that um, really does try to tackle um, the the severe issues with with borderline personality disorder and other other personality disorder representation in media and does a very good job at, at, at addressing that. So yeah, that's what I have for my intro. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, thank you for that, um, Demon. And uh, from one stream to another, I would highly recommend you not look at those threads about you. Um, I, I've been told that there are some highly negative threads about me on the internet. I have never read them. I will never read them um, for my own mental health. Uh, so friend, please protect yourself. Now we need to hear what random assholes on the internet have to say about you. But uh, all right, uh, Sunny, please. Um, I really second that feeling that Demon Mama was talking about, like having BPD and like I I I was uh recently on her stream talking about this and how like I only got diagnosed several months ago and that uh after learned about like this this 
conception of people with BPD and like escaping BPD and like how harmful that was to me and how 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 much fear it put into me of seeking help and like talking and telling doctors like and medical professionals about that. So I I, I really I really feel that. Um, for the as for like the question, um, I I really do have an issue with minimizing any of these neurodivergencies down to one trait to like the most mm. the most visual trait or the most like like shock value trait like or just the one that is most commonly associated you know and just down to that and using it as like an adjective which means that and i have that same feeling for for medical conditions, you know, like, for example, anemia, which is something I also have, is used uh, in baking for if your baked goods don't come out golden and nice looking, you know, when they're pale, they're anemic, you know, like, <laughs> like, that's also something that, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, I don't like minimizing these things that are people's, you know, people's experiences and lives and identities and like, like, huge giant stories. And just down to like the one trait, I do. I do think there is harm done in that. I, I, I give. I think space should be given for you know for ignorance of these terms because you know mental health education is not properly like done in our society. You know, so many people are not aware of mental health and neurodivergence and like even themselves and like where where their mental health is at. And so I give space for like people using these terms, you know, without knowing, but nevertheless, I do think that they are harmful. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm open to the panel, please. Wait, so ugly, we shouldn't stigmatize the stigmatizers? My God, what what has the world come to? Yeah. Surprised, um, uh, or I was surprised, uh, I guess when, when I first got it, into a bunch of stuff right is that uh kind of bit what, what ugly part was saying um yeah it, it doesn't really come down to, to one trait a, a lot of the times these things manifest ma manifest in like m different ways that you didn't imagine it was like oh that's part of this oh that's mm -hmm. part of this right it, it's all these things that you don't hear about i guess in popular descriptions of uh of uh, of of certain conditions right and uh and, and and so i guess when when people have these i guess simplistic i guess visions of of what this condition means and they hear about it they try to accommodate you they try to accommodate you in different ways but based on on i guess the, just a simplistic view of the thing and it might not even address it might not even address how your condition even manifests itself right it's just totally wasted energy like thanks that's sweet but it doesn't help me at all right um and uh yeah uh, that's just my thought on that yeah i guess for me uh especially when it comes to like the associations that come directly as a result of all these different things um i found it like really really uh hard uh growing up um because both my brother and i both have like autism um but because my brother like has it manifested in like a really particular way um and uh, it's really similar to like the way that uh media portrayal is uh, my parents have always uh, kind of like said, well, they didn't want to go ahead and look into what my condition was because it wasn't the same. And not only that, uh, my brother has always been seen to be a kind of like almost like cherubish, like everything that he's doing is like pure, uh, like he can do no wrong um, and he's perfect because he's like he has autism um, and um, anything that he does wrong is it's not like his fault. Um, it's just because he has autism um, and yeah, people with autism, like, you know, we just need to hold them by the hand and lead them to the forest and everything. Um, and like, um, accordingly, um, it wasn't until uh, during COVID that my parents finally uh, agreed to let him uh, move out because they just have always babied him and really just seen him as so, 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 so infantile that he can't even do like basic things by himself. And uh yeah, it's always just been really hard because at times I've been like saying, I'm like, no, like he can, you can make him do his homework. Like just because he has autism doesn't mean that he doesn't need to do his homework. And he, they're always just like, no, no, no. Like we need to make sure that we're codifying all the time, all the time, all the time. Um, 
And it's like, if you're not in line with like exactly how people see autism, then people don't think that you're autistic at all. And then if you are autistic, like the way that you're used to seeing on TV, then it's like, you're an angel. You're perfect. You yeah. Autistic. Hi, Justin. Hi, Scrappy. I, uh... Sorry, I pressed the wrong unmute button. <laughs> I, you know, uh, Katarana, that's interesting because I like the autism association has always been like one of the weirdest ones to me, you know, because people with autism, like people on the internet and, uh, some kind of edgy boys in real life, you know, they'll say like, oh, you're autistic as like an insult to mean like you're stupid or something. But like autistic people are like, not like not stupid. Like, I don't know where the stereotype even come. I think it's because like. For a long time, people with autism were seen as, like, very different, you know, supposedly. And so people would use, like, the R slur for them, and they'd use other language. And it all just kind of got mixed up. And since the word autistic has that has that stinging, that st sound, you know, people now use it as an insult because it, it rolls off the tongue. But I don't think, uh, I don't think that's one with, like, any basis in reality whatsoever. Um, so it confuses me when I see, see people treating them like little babies, you know. Yeah, it's really strange where, like, for all of our uh, different, you know, personality things, it, like, comes with, like, a list, and you don't need to have everything on the list, and some people don't have, like, some of the things on the list, and some of the people do have some of the things on the list, and uh, for some reason, like, you know, when media portrayal is going ahead and doing things like autism, it's, like, they pick very particular parts on the list, where it's, like, <laughs> savant syndrome. Always savant. Plus, yeah, yeah, I mean, look at the Sia movie. Like, she's doing, like, the, like, the dur dur dance moves, and it's like, oh, that's horribly offensive. You can't do that. Like, I, I don't know. I, it feels weird to me that something like that is coming out in 2021. Oh, that uh, in itself was a ridiculous fucking movie. Yeah, that was, that was, that was out there. And to touch yeah. on that further, like, that, that sort of, um, you know, that's led to, like I, like I mentioned with the, the sort of blowback into, um, into it affecting the actual science because people can't overcome their biases and, and actually do the proper research or whatever. I mean, we, we, we now know that like autism is severely underdiagnosed in people who are assigned female at birth, like, like severely so because they just assume that, oh, well, it's going to manifest itself exactly the same. And also like, oh God, it, it ties like, there's so many issues that tie into this that that like I, I could touch on. Like um one of the things that 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 tends to happen is like I think that people like and this is this is one of those areas where the diagnosis is like a double-edged sword sometimes. Because sometimes when you get diagnosed, people will they they stop seeing you as a person and they start seeing you as that thing like you have become this thing and like um that happens like that's something that's very personal to me with regard to bpd it's like oh um the moment somebody finds out it's like oh well then you're just like you're 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 this stereotype you're this type of person you're just gonna blow up and and do this bad thing and i i should run away from you and whatever and it's like no that's like like the, this diagnosis has helped me to know what's going on, things that I didn't see before. And like, it actually, like a diagnosis is supposed to be, uh, I mean, ideally it's supposed to be empowering because it helps you identify and be mindful of the things that you're struggling with. But a lot of times it's like, it's like you're being cast into a box or into a, into a, a frame that, okay, now we figured this out. Now you're in there and you need to do this thing. And it's interesting because um, I like, Do like I guess dodge diagnosis on ADHD for my entire life because I was good at school and like it was considered basically the only thing that people would ever find for ADHD is if you were bad at school other than that it's not ADHD even though I had ADHD I just happened to like fixate very strongly on learning like I couldn't get enough like it just was my favorite thing my favorite thing was to read about history to read about English to read about math because I love that shit and I, I still do to this day. So I did, I happened by chance to do good at school, um, at least until like certain points where it really caught up to me and I couldn't focus on anything anymore. But like, it was a huge shock um, for me to discover that like the way that I learned, which no, because it was, nobody cared and nobody actually looked for any, you know, functional thing. They just look, oh, are you bad at school? Okay, you have a problem. Are you good at school? You don't have a problem. Well, for me, I would sleep through my classes. I would fall asleep during class. I would never like have a huge amount of a hard time listening in class. And I would go home and I would read the entire math book. 
You know what I mean? And just be like, oh, oh cool. I figured out how to do this math thing. How cool. Haha, <laughs> interesting. And then I would fall asleep in class. I would get in trouble for falling asleep in class. I like my physics class, like my teacher didn't give a shit. So like I literally just slept every single day of that class and aced the class because I would go home and read the physics book on my own while playing a video game or in between games of Dota or whatever. And like it was, it was that's how I did it. Nobody knew and nobody ever learned how I learned. And so instead, like when my when I told my parents, for example, that like, hey, I got a diagnosis for ADHD, they're like, what the fuck? I'm like, yeah, as it turns out, the last 10 years of my life where I've been desperately struggling with things that I love, being unable to read and and struggling with like my job and stuff, that had a real a real reason that just got overlooked because of the way that we approach these things because we put people in boxes and stereotypes. You saying that is mm. just like so crazy validating when I thought it. Cause yeah, like the same exact thing like goes for me, like with uh for myself I basically just think in numbers for all times all the time so you know for like math classes and stuff I would do really well um but I don't have the focus to go ahead and actually focus on anything that's not just writing on a board because the way I learn uh, when people say things out loud it's not good enough for me so that's why most of the time when I watch tv I always put the captions on I just can't really absorb uh things because I lose focus too much uh and in classes you know I, I used to get in trouble for very age for just falling asleep all the time and everything you know at the end of the day I still got pretty good grades so my parents were just like eh, it's, it's fine and then suddenly when I get to university and not everybody all the time I'm like what <laughs> you're not gonna write like, I don't know what, what's happening here and like university has like been so like hard just because uh basically having to go ahead and circumvent and figure out like your entire learning style what all your issues are while also essentially like being in a perpetual state of learning all the time is insane. So yeah, it's just uh, nice to know that uh, a lot of people have um, had hard times getting their diagnoses just because, well, yeah, like you can read, so like you're fine, right? Like you don't have ADHD, like you, yeah. you, yeah. you like- Until it becomes a problem yeah, for I other see. people, mm -hmm. then why, yeah. why is there a problem? Yeah. I a similar yeah. experience. It's like them trying to figure out how I learned best. Um, I, I I wasn't sure who it was trying to go. Um, but like they thought like, oh, uh, it's I'm going to misgender myself, but it's in the past. So it's fine. Uh, oh, he works best with like uh, hands on stuff. Uh, oh, well, let's put him in shop class. Well, he can't handle the loud noises of of like, I don't think they noticed the loud noises thing, but I couldn't handle the loud noises. Uh, of shop class and so i didn't do well there because you know if you don't want to use an electric sander you probably can't get very far or at least it takes forever and um so they put me back into like more like verbal based learning like the thing that doesn't work with cat and definitely doesn't work with me um so what's like what's funny about that is like the diagnosis of like having been diagnosed at an early age would have explained so much, not just for me, but for the people, because I lived in group homes and behavioral schools and all these things who were taking care of me. And had they like, uh, had they recognized that like, oh, he's not misbehaving, he just can't handle the situation. Uh, I think that would have helped a lot because a lot of the behavioral redirection that I got was like, punishment, like basically saying like, you, you shouldn't act this way. Uh, so here's the consequence. And then, like, I try to explain them, but I'm not trying to be this way. Uh, but uh, there just there isn't like a, there isn't training for people who work in group homes and behavioral schools and stuff like that to like facilitate that information. It's just they have to do what they have to do to maintain control of the situation, sort of like cops actually. And um, and uh, so they don't they don't say like, um, oh well, you did this thing that like for any other kid we take away their toys. But you you did it because you're autistic, uh, so we're not going to do that. They're just, they're just simply going to say something simple and stupid, like, um, uh, "Oh, if we do that for you, all the other kids will get mad, so we can't uh, give you special treatment." We have, um, I have a, I have kind of a, a disciplinary, uh, or not disciplinary, I guess a harmony challenge. Right? I have, I have four kids, so it's, and two of them have diagnosis. Anyways, there's a big rivalry between number one and number two. And uh, number two has all these diagnoses, right? And so, and so number one keeps throwing it in our face. Oh, when, oh, I get it. When I act like a bitch, all right, it's nothing. I'm just acting like a bitch. But when this per, when my sister acts like a bitch, oh, now it's all her conditions and stuff like that. And I fucking hate her for it, right? 
<laughs> and uh, I don't know, just the, I, I don't know. I, I think uh, it just because you, you made me think of this in, in terms of like ascribing certain, I guess, bad personality traits and then just ascribing them to, to whatever condition. And I guess that's something, that's something I'm, I, I guess, struggling with struggling with as well you know adhd especially if it's severe interferes in your relationships huge the the effect apparently apparently according to all these articles i've been reading okay it's huge right so so now it's like it's like when you have a conflict in the relationship is it the adhd or am i just being a shitty person right in this uh in in this type of relation uh you know in whatever our, our relationship dynamics right uh, do, I, do i get a pass for this and my even my wife and my wife and i you know sometimes you talk it's like look i get you have the <laughs> i get you have the the diagnosis thing but but it makes me feel it makes me feel fucking shitty when you do this like it feels like you're not listening like you're not interested in, in what i'm saying i'm like ah i feel terrible about it I realize that a lot of the stuff has caused conflicts, you know, in the past. I mean, they're not insurmountable, but it's stuff I wish I could get rid of, right? Uh, because because it, it causes so many, I guess, snowballing effects in terms of conflicts that we had to like uh, surmount. And then and then yeah, how do you separate it? How do you separate your condition from just regular you being shitty sometimes, which happens because we're all kind of human, right? Uh, Sunny, you yeah. wanted to say something previously, and then I will go yeah. to uh, Demon and Marcy, okay? And then Kara. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I, yeah, I just want to mention that I'm, I'm actually within that process at the moment of getting, uh, help for my ADHD and that despite being, uh, 23 years old in a month and being in university that my doctor is asking for my report cards from high school to see if I have ADHD. And I, very similar to Demon Mama, I I did I did fine and dandy in high school, despite, but I, um, I was absent all of the time. Like that was the way that it really manifested for me is I couldn't, I couldn't be physically at school with like other people talking and noises and distractions that I was like, it was such a barrier for me that I, had like something like in my like final year like I was in school for like 90 days or something it was crazy but still got like scholarships to like the best university in the like the second best in the country um and that now that a lot of the the symptoms that are impeding my ability to get my education at university developed only within the past like couple years you know like as my brain has like developed and now these are presenting and now uh it's like making university impossible like forget about the zoom classes oh my god i it's not it does not work with my brain um but i it's it's like it's it's like how do you how do you prove these things like to doctors how do you show this when they're the the information that they're looking for to prove it is uh you know report cards from freaking like five years ago or uh a call from my like abusive parent who doesn't care mm. uh, like that's yeah uh demon marcy and cat demon please yeah, so there are a few things I wanted to touch on. The first one is uh, school system. Um, I talk about this a lot on my channel. I think our school system is um, really, really messed up. And and that's not because of teachers. Uh, it's not because of principals or anything like that, really. it's um, In fact, they're doing their best as they can. It's just it's designed to basically be a children's prison. Um, and, and I know that sounds a little bit ridiculous off, like, like off the cuff. It's like, oh, wow, that seems very, um, ridiculous, you know, extreme, but, but no, like the schools, uh, schools treat people who aren't like able to, to, to fall into a very specific type of learning so poorly. It's unbelievable. And like the, the number of people in my life who, you know, are also neuroatypical neurodivergent, like have, and they're, they're, they're the likelihood of them having finished school, just like, it's like, phew, because it's so bad. It's so horrible. And there's like simple things as much as it's like, I, I think that sometimes people refer to stuff like ADHD and, and, and various other, uh, you know, disorders or whatever as like mental illnesses, but it's like, no, they become a mental illness because there's no flexibility whatsoever. Like I learned much later in life. This is an example of what I'm talking about. Like I've learned, like 
I can do work now, even when I don't take my ADHD meds. Because in fact, I would argue that my habits have become more powerful than the meds ever were, even though the meds did help me get control of, of everything. I certainly appreciate having them. But a lot of my habits and the way that I changed um, living my life has made a huge difference. And it's stuff like, like I'll share a little anecdote that I that works for me. For me, when it comes to stimulation, um, I am like I am very very much in the ADHD. Like my brain is always going over. I'm hopping between windows. I'll have like three windows open on my computer doing things at once. And I discovered that like uh, this metaphor that kind of works well, which is that I have realized my brain is like kind of like a radio, and I need to tune just enough stimulation. So that the the radio waves align like in a, a mug of sus, you know, ever ever done the commu communication, you got to turn the knobs and make the waveforms match. And if I get that, if I find that for me, it's like, like two to three channels of stimulation, listen to something, look at something and do something. And if I do that, I'll hit a zone of focus, even whether I'm on my medication or not. And that's a that's a life changing discovery, because previously, everyone would just be like, just do the thing, just do it five head. And it's like, no, it's not that simple. If we had a school system that even flexed even a little bit, people who who are seen as like mentally ill and disordered wouldn't be seen as mentally ill or disordered. If we made it possible for schools to, I don't know, have slightly different paths where somebody can listen to music while listening to um, the, the 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 lesson as long as they're listening and taking notes or whatever, that could probably that could probably change people's experience like so much. Even just having alternative class structures could make so much of a difference. And like that's why. I say like it really is like right now for a lot of people schools for a lot of young kids especially neurodivergent kids schools feel like a prison because you're put into a room and you have to behave a certain way and nobody tells you why it doesn't feel good to you and they punish you when it doesn't feel good to you or when you can't succeed under it and then you that those punishments lead to more punishments which leads to you falling behind so yeah that's like uh, that's one of the things I wanted to touch on the other thing I want to touch on was what, what Monty brought up which was about like oh sometimes you can't like, uh, you can't tell if it's just you being a piece of shit or if it's your disorder. And realistically, almost always, it's a little bit of both. Um, like, especially, I know that especially with, like, BPD. Like, like it's, th I have a serious problem with self-splitting. It's, like, a serious issue. And that's also a part of BPD that people don't talk about is a lot of, pe a lot of people with borderline personality. Um, people are familiar with splitting, which is like um, in moments of duress, you tend to uh, revert to like a black and white outlook, which can lead to extremely explosive conflicts with family members. But what people never talk about is that it's actually incredibly common for people to internalize splitting and basically go between seeing yourself as like, I'm, I'm like on my game. I'm so fucking good. I'm like, I'm killing it. I'm amazing to five minutes later being like, you could literally look. And I, and I, this is something I recently talked about on my stream. Like I've been having a lot of good growth on my stream lately and I can look at the numbers. I can see that they're all good, that they're like amazing. And, and I can go, I am a worthless worm. Like, why does anybody even bother look at, listening to me any day? And that is like so severe. It's so severe sometimes that like, it's it's almost gotten to the point like recently I've noticed because I've come I've made so much progress that like I can sit there and almost laugh at it because I'm like I'm like sitting here and I have an objective positive in front of me and my brain is just going no it's bad though it's bad though but that's bad and I'm like no it fucking isn't and I know and it's like it's it's almost weird because you you get to this point where you're like you can almost have an argument with your own brain and it's like but, but, you know, sometimes in other cases, it really is a little bit. And one of the things, one of the examples, sorry, I'm going on a little bit, but I, I wanted to make sure I got this, this out. Um, one of the things that I found like incredibly, incredibly valuable is like being like radically honest and communicative with loved ones. Like, for example, um, I didn't like, this is something I've done my whole life that I didn't notice until like very, you know, very recently after I figured out the whole BPD thing. Um, but like, I would um, panic about people's like, and this is very common with BPD for people to be like hyper empathetic. Like you watch every single movement of somebody's face and you're like, oh shit, they're mad at me. Oh fuck. And I realized that like, um, I had always been asking people like, oh, are you mad at me? Are you mad at me? And it would drive people nuts. Cause I didn't even notice I was doing it. It would like, they'd be like, yes, I'm not, no, no, I'm not mad at you. Like, holy shit. And I'm like, so I got to the point where I'm like, Hey, like, um, if you ever catch me doing that and I might do it, just remind me that I'm doing it, you know, gently, please, if you wouldn't mind. And also know that the only reason I'm asking is because I severely struggle to know whether you're actually mad at me or not. And I really care. So, and 
I have been very for, for, forward with basically everyone in my life um, in talking about that. And it has made it basically a non-issue. People in my life don't interpret it wrong. They don't think I'm being annoying or mean. And I do, and, and as a result, the pressure is off me. And it means that I, I worry about it less, even though it's always there a little bit. So like, it just goes to show you like those levels of communication and honesty together can like help smooth out what would be miscommunications. Um, and that is especially important when like one of my partners has aut autism and like, it's especially important that we understand each other in that way. So, yeah. Marcy and then Kara. Right. So, um, God, there's, there's a lot to respond to. Um, so I, um, what should I start with? <laughs> Monty, I wanted to kind of comment on what you were saying, right? Um, I have had a lot of relationship issues that have tied in pretty heavily with my ADHD. Um, I will sometimes forget to do chores for weeks at a time. Uh, I will go and start doing something else in the middle of doing something, and then the first thing won't get done. Uh, I find that sometimes in the middle of a conversation, I'll remember some task I have to do, and I'll just walk away from the person who's talking to me. And then I'll come back after having done the task and be like, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I was listening. Like, and like they'll have stopped talking and I'll just look like the rudest, bitchiest person. But uh, that <laughs> that's an issue, right? Um, and so I think that with ADHD and things like that, you know, it's a bit more, it's a bit more set inside. But with something like BPD, which I have shown signs of forever and only haven't been diagnosed with because um, when I was a kid, I went and I talked to my therapist about it and they were like, we don't like diagnosing young people with BPD, like teenagers, because uh, those traits can sometimes fade as you go into adulthood, right? Um, like if they diagnosed BPD in teenagers, it would be like really, really overdiagnosed. Um, and so, you know, as my brain is wrinkled and things have sorted themselves out, uh, I, I've kept a lot of those traits, so I should probably go back and talk to that. But, you know, with things like BPD or NPD or like more personality disorder type things, um, a lot of the times these are as, as coping mechanisms, right? Um, with narcissistic personality disorder, you can grow up being very undervalued um, by the people around you. Or, I mean, this is one of a million things that, that can develop that sort of thing. But then, I mean, it, it's a coping mechanism for you to hype yourself up to a certain degree. Um, with with BPD, it's a big one, right? The splitting, the um, lack of, like, emotional regulation, the behaviors that some people describe. I don't like this word as, like, manipulative or whatever. All of that stuff can, can be born out of necessity, right? It can be born yeah. out of growing up and, and, like, being forced to survive by doing things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel like we, as a society, need to internalize this idea of having empathy for people even when we are experiencing a moment of disagreement with them. Um, for instance, like, I might be having an argument with somebody and they know they know my, my situation, right? Um, obviously, and everyone likes to hammer this point home, so I'm not going to stress it too hard. I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah, I have ADHD. I have undiagnosed BPD. Like, that's my excuse. You know, nobody does that. We're not we're not saying like that's my excuse for why I'm being like this. But uh, a person who's had a bad day, who has no sort of anything going on that's wrong with them and like perfectly healthy coping mechanisms and all that is going to be significantly less bad in their bad moments than a person who does have all that stacked on top of them. Right. And so I, I think that we need to consider that and and maybe maybe take it a little bit easy on people in our interpersonal lives when we know that they're they're suffering from these sorts of things uh, and we get into these interpersonal interactions with them because i a lot of the time i will cool down after like an argument and then i'll be like damn i didn't mean any of that i was <laughs> you know uh so i think that's an issue to speak to demon mama's point and i waited till you came back for this uh, on the education system uh so i fucking hate the american school system uh it's garbage it's especially garbage in red states for obvious reasons, um, but all over the country, it's garbage. Uh, is my mic too loud? No. It's, it's bursting up into the red you're, on my stream. Oh, you're, you're fine. Oh, well, you're fine here. At least I've adjusted your mic, so it's fine for me. So. Right, awesome. Um, I, but yeah, like, it sounds like hippy-dippy bullshit to say this, but school in the United States is like making a bunch of different animals climb the same tree. You know, you design a system around people who are good at specific, like certain skills. And then everybody who doesn't have those skills tuned to the point that they should is going to fall way behind, even if they're extremely skilled in other areas, you know? And so I think that the way we structure a uh, school system, like at least uh, through, we should have, obviously there needs to be some degree of like generalized knowledge that we all get. 
clearly, but like what exists now um, is just enough so that you'll be able to work a middle management position. And if you can't be squeezed into a middle management position, you're considered cannon fodder for the military or the prison system. And that and, and you're processed through school like like meat, you know, and so it's 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 really gross uh, the way they do that, the way that we do that as a country. Um, people, it's especially strong for people with like neurodivergencies, right? Um, because maybe if your personality just isn't inclined towards learning like the, the the standard middle management set of skills, then you'll have issues in school. But if that's the case for you, and also you have like ADHD, like I did, you know, and oh, depression is a huge one that interacts with uh, the way we are in like our academics and stuff, right? I would go home, I would listen in class, I'd fall asleep sometimes. Uh, my senior year, I developed a habit of like, asking to go to the bathroom and walking around for 45 minutes just just vibing because I couldn't sit still for that long but I'd get home and suddenly all that nervous energy from school is gone and I'm just I'm just a wreck and I can't do anything and I don't get any homework done you know and I I my grades suffered hugely for it and now I'm going to college on a bunch of loans and not scholarships and and you know I think that's sad I I think it's sad that people uh who have different styles of learning aren't uh, taken to their highest potential in the school system. That's that's kind of strange to me. Let's go to Karana in the Ninth House. Yeah, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit um, more about like uh, NPD because I just I see so much stupid fucking pop psych. You know, some uh, lady that says she's a psychologist on TikTok saying, you know, here are the signs that you're so you know you're around somebody with narcissistic personality disorder. And like I see it, it's like, first of all, like, uh, yeah, they're like a manipulative bitch that wants to fucking ruin your life and uh, they're plotting and it's like, oh my lord. And it's like, it's so hard for me to like sit there and watch stuff like this because like, you know, um, I like, the reason why uh, I um, have narcissistic personality disorder, like the way that I manifest it is that I always feel like I need to overcompensate and like make sure that... Uh, people in a room don't think I'm stupid so I'm always worried that I'm coming off as really stupid um and um I anybody that thinks uh like less of me or has a different like lens of me than I do it really really frustrates me and it's like it's a direct uh, you know cause or the it's a direct link to the fact that like my parents and I have communication and like their like idea of me is so different from my idea of me and it's just like it that's where it comes from and it's like I don't hate anyone. I have I have a really hard time understanding people's emotions, but it's it's not like I use it in a bad way. And I, I yeah, it's essentially just like I just want to be successful, but I'm not going to hurt anyone on the way. And I want other people to be successful too. And you know, the whole thing with us isn't that we're like, you know, we're just going to fucking kill everybody. And you know, don't be our friends because we're just a bunch of fucking dicks. And it's like it's so strange. Um, and like. Yeah, I guess the whole idea is that it's also be like partially propagated and stuff by people that say that they're psychologists and stuff. And obviously, you know, social media doesn't have any way of actually betting anybody and saying, yes, this person is a verified psychiatrist that is going ahead and giving factual information. But it's not like it's any less hurtful. And like this TikTok that I saw had like over a million views. And I was like, you're ruining my fucking life. Like, you're literally ruining thing, my life. Like, things like this is like ruining my life and then you know uh sometimes when i first meet somebody uh you'll you'll they'll have a recognize i'm having a hard time understanding like where are they coming from and uh i'll just say oh yeah like it's because of like npd and people are like i'm not gonna do anything <laughs> like i promise i i don't want to do anything to you um and a lot of it just like ends up overly manifesting and I just try so much to like make sure that like I'm making others happy because I know that I'm not going to make myself happy and that's where my narcissism is manifesting and just yeah I I I really um I guess it's just one of those particular ones where there's not even like enough nuance to it like you know some people I, I feel like a lot of people luckily have at least one autistic person in their life so they're able to go ahead or at least some one person that will go ahead and say that yes i'm autistic in their life to go ahead and balance off some of the uh, media portrayal but uh you know i've never met anybody else that says that they have npd so the only npd that people know is me so automatically it's just like so you're gonna kill me right <laughs> 
<laughs> and it sucks. It's really, really unhelpful. And, um, you know, um, I, I saw like a couple of weeks ago, um, Eris um, had posted on Twitter about, um, yeah, like are people with uh, um, like NPD manipulative? And I'm like, no, that's just their personality. Like that's literally like you can have NPD and not be manipulative and you can have NPD and be manipulative. So uh, let's go. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have more to say? Right. Manipulative let's... in what way? Um, Karana, you want to answer that? Sorry, what was the question? May I ask, like, manipulative in, in, in what way? Like, if you have an example, and this is just out of curiosity since we're, we're here learning about things. I'm just, I'm just curious myself. Sure. I mean, as someone that's personally not manipulative, I'm not entirely sure what people expect out of me when they say that MPD is manipulative. Um, so I can yeah. speak on like how BPD is seen as manipulative. Um, yeah, that would be helpful. They're probably similar. yeah, because I've you know I've I've probably yeah I'm certain that I have exhibited that symptom, and it's it's the way that I understand it is that it's that you know like what you want, you know what you want the other person to do, and you're acting a way to specifically get to that point. So if I could just speak on my experience like real fast, um, I developed BPD due to a very long history, basically since I was born, of child abuse within my family. And so I developed manipulative techniques to like say like not have like this person in my family yell at me, you know? Like if like this like thing happens, like um you know, like at the dinner table, like I won't eat my like steak or whatever. Um, and I, I would manipulate a parent to be like more okay with me, like not eating the steak, you know, that it's like to get a specific result. And that is, that is manipulation. And it, be, and it, you know, that's it, that can present a lot of issues in your life and a lot of harm, obviously. But it it's like it's like how I think Marcy was talking about the coping mechanisms and how BPD a lot of it is coping that it that's I think really where that derives you know that you're you're trying to control a situation so that you're not harmed from it or like perceived like I, I'd like to, I'd like to talk oh, oh, about after nine yeah nine tells. after nine tells yeah because yeah, I just wanted to say that I, I want to respond to that question myself sure, sure. as well as um, and, I, and Marcy I see your hand up um just and we all can decide exactly what you want to do just for time's sake uh you know there are other topics so I'm not sure if we want to move to that or just focus on this this is fine one way or the other um but just so you know I want to respect everyone's you know schedules um but nine tails. Uh, yeah, my schedule is open, so like as far as time goes, I'm fine, but I'd also like to talk about the other subjects, so that's my vote. Um, yeah, as far as like, uh, I, I raised my hand along before we started talking about manipulation, but I do have something to uh, contribute to that, which is that uh, one example would be like uh, someone like me, um, who is very insecure, like incredibly insecure, especially with like long term relationships where I get like the closer to someone I get, the more insecure I get. Um, and so like my like with autism it can be like you feel overwhelmed by all these impulses to do something and like it's really hard to just fight them back and be like no this isn't what i want to do because your brain's still trying to do it and um that usually excuse me even though like i'm not uh like a manipulative person or i don't even have intents to manipulate people the things that like i've sort of subconsciously learned throughout my life to keep people from ignoring me and to keep because obviously like group home staff and stuff like that being ignored is pretty terrible um and to keep like reassured about things that are just really petty and trivial um like it, it, it's less about that being my tendency and more like the my lack of impulse control and so that, that's where like i wish people would wouldn't focus so much on like the behavior like i know that like what matters is the behaviors that affect them and they just stop there. They just say, like, oh, you're just manipulative. And it's like, no, actually, I think a lot of, like, I think I have pretty normal impulses for someone who's been through what I've been through. It's my inability to regulate my impulses as an issue. Okay. Um, so, uh, Marcy had her hand up for a long time. So, uh, we'll go to Marcy, then Dion. Okay. 
I just want to speak to the kind of uh, manipulation and coping mechanism point, right? I, because I don't have the official diagnosis on BPD, um, I don't feel as though I can talk about it, but um, I, I relate. Um, but something I do have, I think, the authority to talk about is um, with my like hypochondria and stuff, right? The way I don't trust my own body and I don't trust the signals that my brain sends me about whether or not I'm okay, it stems from uh, child abuse and being legitimately gaslit as a child into like never believing that I could be right or that I could trust myself or my body or any anything like that, you know? And that continued on into high school as I realized that I had gender dysphoria, but I didn't want to come out because I was in like a little small shitty redneck town, you know? So I just like these things pile onto people and they manifest in the weirdest ways and they can manifest physically and mentally and in all the, and I, I just think that we all need to have more empathy for each other because like, I, I mean, I've spoken to so many people who it feels very, very good to diagnose someone. It makes you feel powerful, makes you feel like you're the therapist and you're the normal one and the smart one. And that's why all these threads, you know, Demon Mama, you were talking about it. They always bring up like, oh, this person's a narcissist. This person's a, like has BPD, this person, because it feels really, really good to like call someone like a psychopath or something, you know, because you're, you're making the diagnosis, you're making the call, but uh, it's extremely harmful. And I wish people would stop doing it because it pushes a lot of a lot of negative stigma. And honestly, I don't even think we'd have to be here to talk about this kind of thing if if that didn't happen. But okay, uh, let's go to Dear Mama, and then I guess we'll consider whether we want to change topics. Yeah, I'm definitely for sure very interested in doing topic three if we can. I think that's a really important one. But um, but yeah, I, I wanted to touch on the sort of um idea of manipulativeness. So. One of the things that can happen, and I think this is like this is a problem that that happens in discussions about all types of mental processes, all types of mental illness, all types of neurodivergence, is that um, people get like, I don't know, they get very um, essentialist, and then they also forget that like um, everything is a, is like a def is like these definitions are none of them are rock solid. Um, <laughs> I don't know if people know this or if people think about this very frequently, but we live in a society that they're very, very passively manipulative. We are bombarded with advertisements. We are bombarded with salespeople. I worked in sales for a long time. I excelled very, very well at sales. Uh, I guess maybe no surprise there. I was incredibly good at it, as in literally award-winning. And um, that is a that is a uh, basically a um, field that that that. Um, is all about manipulation, but nobody would say that like everyone who works in sales is borderline personality. No, manipulation is often uh, relative and al also a matter of perspective. Um, that's not saying that it always is or anything like that. There's definitely clear cut examples. Um, but a lot of times the, the manipulativeness side of it um, comes uh, in my in my experience is inc incidental. It's usually as a result of someone not being aware of, of their own struggles with their um, you know, their disorder or whatever, or even you don't even have to look at it in the framework of a disorder. It's even if you take out that part of it, you can just say it's somebody who doesn't really know themselves and they haven't realized their own flaws yet. And that happens. And it's increasing. It's especially hard when you have stuff like, like what I was talking about, where, uh, your brain is just, it feels like your brain is literally telling you one thing and your eyes are telling you something else. Um, it's very difficult to deal with that. And so sometimes, um, I know for my, uh, for myself, um, I had a really hard time with like relationships for like throughout my, for, with certain types of relationships, especially throughout my twenties. Um, and some of that was because of, um, you know, just not knowing that my per perception was skewed on certain things. And also like sometimes, sometimes my, my perspective on myself and I would conclude that like, like, I mean, I, I allowed myself to be abused by somebody for a very long time because I was a hundred percent convinced that like, no, like it is, I would split and I would say, no, like you are, you are the problem here. Like, what the hell are you doing? You fucked up everything. And there have been other times where, um, I have taken something that was, um, you know, not necessarily innocuous, but may have been negative, And I took that much further than I needed to. Um, or than I should have simply because I didn't realize that, uh, you know, my, my personality disorder was, was magnifying that or twisting it in some way. And, 
um, that's where the, the quote unquote manipulativeness can often usually comes from is from just incidental. It's just your survival mechanisms, like scraping up against somebody else's survival mechanisms or their, or whatever. And that doesn't mean that it's like all excused and like, like obviously. Um, and of course there are some people who's, um, like their approach and whatever is significantly worse than others. I mean, I've known people who I've known a person specifically who did a lot of harm to people I care about who meets basically every criteria for the stereo, the biggest stereotypes of borderline personality disorder. And I think they were a really bad person. I, I really like they, they ca caused a lot of harm and they refused to consider that maybe there was something on their side, but you know, that's not just, that's not exclusive to people with BPD. Um, it just can be made, it can just be made worse or worse in a certain way because, you know, because of various reasons. And, uh, and it's interesting, you know, I find it very, I don't know. I find it good that everyone here is being so willing to talk about like, like the fact that a lot of this stuff comes from um, experiences with abuse or with severely bad treatment. Um, BPD is incredibly, incredibly high correlation with childhood abuse. Um, and especially specifically emotional abuse. If you have somebody in your family who's extremely emotionally manipulative, uh, then there's a good chance that then your your response to that will be a disordered response because you are attempting to survive a disordered individual who may not know they're disordered or who might be insisting that you're actually the problem and you evolve a response in, in response to that that when you then go out of that area um, and into a non-traumatic environment, you don't necessarily know how to get rid of it or you might not even know that you're doing it. So it is very complicated. Um, but when people talk about a lot of times people talk about manipulativeness in a very essentialist way that like, ah, you're nar you have, you know, narcissistic personality disorder or borderline personality disorder. That means you're constantly conniving and searching for no, it's like, no, you've lived with somebody your entire life uh, who who uh, is, you know, like in my case, like I live with parents who are incredibly emotionally um, erratic, like more so than even myself. And, and in order to survive that, in order to, um, to like deal with that and the way that they externalize those emotions, I had to learn how to, to read a pin drop in a, in a, in a cacophony. I had to learn how to be so observant of every person around me that, oh shit, I see somebody's eye twitching. Oh shit, they're pissed. I'm going to run for cover. I'm going to go find a way to get out of here. And that can lead you to do stuff like, oh, I'm leaving dinner now because somebody's eye twitched across the table. And if you live with an eye twitch, meaning, oh shit, shit's about to go down. You're just like, all right, I'm leaving. I'm heading home early. Bye everybody. And everyone's like, what the fuck's going on? And you're like, oh, well, somebody's eye was twitching and oh, well, oh, okay. That's different. Okay. So like, you see what I'm saying? A lot of it's incidental is, is just what I'm trying to get at, I guess. Let's, uh, uh, all right, well, Colorado, do you want to stick with this or do you want to maybe? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I just, I, I just really quickly thought of something that can be seen as manipulation, but I'll go super quick just so we can switch sure. just because Montreal initially asked me. Um, so because I'm always in like a constant, no problem. I like at a constant state of fear that like I'm an idiot and like I'm, I'm incompetent. So anytime there's like a slight perception um, of the, I, I'm, I, I have the feeling that someone thinks I'm stupid or uh, I'm not doing a good job at something, my, my day is completely ruined. Um, I've had times where uh, just because uh, someone um, went ahead and like, put a job that they worked at with me and I was their supervisor. I think it's because I did something so wrong that the person didn't want to work with me anymore. And it gets me to points uh, often where like, I've been like borderline suicidal just because I'm like, everybody hates me. I'm like, I'm the worst leader ever. I'm not good at this. Like who put me here? Da, da, da. Um, so then quite often, you know, I'll have to go ahead and like call up uh, you know, different friends and let them know like, Hey, I really need someone to stay with me tonight. Cause I don't really feel like I could go ahead and like be safe by myself. Um, and in those situations, uh, those have been times where I could see that someone would potentially see it as, uh, manipulative because basically my friends have to sit there and like affirm me all day. Like, no, you're actually really good. No, like you're not bad at your job. Someone could see that as potentially being manipulative, but more it's just like, I'm not doing it because I'm trying to be malicious. I'm doing it because sometimes I just really need the extra validation because I don't have any of those centers in myself to ever think anything I'm doing is good. So I always need someone else to let me know I'm doing good. And even when they do tell me I'm good, most of the time I just tell them that they're wrong. So and it's not manipulation. It's me just genuinely feeling like shit all the time. 
Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, all of you, thank you for sharing that. Um, let, let me try to uh, move on to uh, another topic because, uh, um, yeah, just to uh, reflect your time. Uh, TV Mama, you're interested in topic three, um, and then so was Sunny. Um, are the other two um, topic three? Was that good or something good for you? All right, great. All right, so I guess we'll just do topic three. Um, uh, if you could uh, read that. Do you find value in being neurodivergent? Um, if you had a choice to become normal norm normative, would you take it? And uh, are the efforts uh, to go ahead and cure our conditions actually productive and wanted? Um, I've been seeing a lot of uh, discourse in the space of autism of like, stop trying to cure autism. Um, but, you know, some of our uh, things, sometimes we might not feel like it's all that integral to our uh, personality more. It's just an inhibitor more than anything. So yeah, how do you feel? Would you do you want this? If we could get rid of whatever your um, neural divergency is, would you find that productive? Do you think people would be happier not having it anymore? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's go to Montreal. Um. Yeah. I mean, so I I only found out I had ADHD, like. A few months ago yeah, yeah i guess yeah five six months ago right i'm 40 it's never been a problem i'm i've always been functional got two two university degrees uh you know never studied but whatever you know it's it's just as long as it wasn't a problem for other people i guess it's it's not been a problem right uh, the only thing is is that is that i realize uh, the only time it became a problem is is when is when life got hectic with kids and there's just so many things bombarding you and, and, and vying for your attention that it's, it's just, it became impossible. It became impossible to, to tune into anything. And before that, before that, I would, I would call at least my version of inattentive ADHD. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. I mean, it'll only, it, it, it warded me off bullshit essentially because bullshit didn't interest you right and if it's not interesting then you don't care about it you don't put in energy into it right and then when something does interest you you hyper focus on it right and you do amazing uh you do amazing and this is this has been something that served me in my life uh, fantastically until of course uh until of course fragmenting my attention to a million tiny pieces because everyone's starting to get their um you know has their needs and, 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 and yeah and, and they need your attention and then you can't focus in on anything and now it becomes a problem. Right. And even then, and even then, I guess uh, I've kind of been functional. The only time I realized, Oh, maybe, maybe I have this thing. I had one daughter diagnosed with it and I was like, okay, well, these are similar. I guess they're just more uh, accentuated with her. Right. And I had another daughter diagnosed with it. And when, when the psychiatrist sat us down and told us how it affected her, I was like, oh, this is a condition? You mean it's treatable? You mean I don't have to deal with this anymore? Right? It was uh it was kind of fantastic. But again, it's like I I don't think I would I don't think I would give it up. I don't think I would give it up just because there's there's something when you get into the hyper hyper focus, that kind of flow state, right? That's very attractive, that's very blissful, right? You love to be in there and you don't want to get out of there and 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 being yanked out of it is really difficult. It's really difficult and 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 so frustrating, and uh, and honestly, honestly, was just one of the worst feelings. But being in it, being in it, it's amazing, right? As especially if you can, if you have the space and time to run its course. So it's like it's it's not that it's not that I would wish to not have this thing. I I wish I had known earlier so I could structure my life in a way that was more accommodating to the way my brain works um that was more uh yeah that i didn't fall into these kind of traps of what you're supposed to structure your life as when you when you have children and stuff and and it, uh, i'd start building with the knowledge that oh your brain just works differently and you need to take advantage of it right uh instead of instead of trying they, i think that's the problem at least with the adhd i don't know how you feel about the, the other conditions right but uh but that, that's how i feel it's not that it's not that this thing's a curse it's that it's that it doesn't it's it's sticking a square it's taking a square into a round hole right and and you just get frustrated that it doesn't fit 
and uh and that's it and for me it would just be like okay well i would have spent i wish i'd found out earlier uh because i would have spent my i would have spent more time looking for more square holes if that makes any sense with that metaphor um okay i think that's uh yeah that that's all i have to say about that right now sure 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 um a nine tails and we could keep the reductions brief so we can jump to the full conversation um but yeah Oh, you just had to say that before me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so not a straightforward answer for me. So like, first thing, I love myself. Uh, I love the journeys that I've taken. And I think it's like to have this perspective on the world is amazing. So it's it's really hard to want to give that up. Secondly, like I'm trans. And like, it's the same question for being trans. Would you rather transition earlier? Like, uh, the answer would have been yes, had I not been neuro neurodivergent. Uh, but I feel like transitioning early on when I did with all the behaviors, uh, behavioral issues that I had, that would have just compounded things. So it, it is really complicated for me. Like on one hand, heck, I could have even realized my identity earlier if I wasn't struggling through behavioral schools and stuff like that. So it's kind of uh, just an infinite yes and no for me, depending on how you take the question. Okay. Uh, I'm icy. Uh, muted, buddy. There we go. Thanks, Prime. You're 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 a real sweetheart. All right. Um, I can't really speak to the autism question because, as a non-autistic person, I feel I don't I can't speak on that. Um, but as for like ADHD, right? <clears throat> it's tough for me. I do kind of wish I was born without it because, as I was when I was growing up, um, my symptoms were a lot different, right? Now it kind of manifests as I lose shit. I, you'll notice I'm using a new notebook now. I lost the old one uh, in the middle of going to the bathroom. Don't know what happened to it. But, uh, you know, now it, it manifests in that way. But when I was a kid, it manifested as uh, extreme hyperactivity and uh, extreme inattentiveness and all, all of these. It was so much worse when I was a kid, you know. Um, and because of that, in school, in grade school, um, not so much grade school, but in middle school and like the first year I had of high school, I was treated um, like I was stupid. I was like my people I went to school with treated me like uh, one of the and I'm going to use this is not PC, but one of the special kids, you know, they like and I was always so frustrated because I was like, why are you treating me like that? Right. Like I'm very like uh what what is the word uh sentient you know i'm very like conscious of of my experience i don't like that you're treating me like a person who can't uh like see uh mm. i lost it lost my train of thought i i, I just i i don't like the uh stigma that came with growing up with that kind of symptom you know what i mean so i don't know necessarily if i'd say i wish i never had it but i certainly wish we lived in a world where people weren't treated like crazy monsters because of uh, things they can't control for sure team and mama um yeah n n i can't say I, I i really don't like uh the approach of like curing uh things like this uh i think it's a really eugenicist approach to be completely blunt um and also i think that it um it, it uh, there's a lot of things i could say about it but basically i think that it's it kind of snuffs out human potential um we could build a better society where people like myself probably wouldn't even there wouldn't even be a thing called any of these disorders probably it would just be hey okay you adapt to things a little differently here's a here's a i mean i don't know we we do this right like humans do this all the time we adjust things to our own preferences in so many ways everything from you can go as 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 broad as something like agriculture, us literally changing the landscape to suit us better, to the way that we decorate our houses, to the, the things that we choose to wear for various reasons, whether it's fabrics that we find comfortable or, or or music that we like to listen to. And I mean, the only thing that like so many people come up against, so many people with ADHD and and you know, other other I mean, I could talk about BPD as a separate thing, but I mean there's there's so much that I could talk about. There's this there was this great meme that I saw the other day that was posted to um I can't remember it was to an ADHD subreddit that I was on or something and it had it was the you know the 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 cheems the strong cheems and then there's the sad crying cheems or the little doge 
you know? And on the strong side, it was like, it was like, I am the most advanced hunter gatherer that anyone has ever seen. I have single handedly made my tribe the strongest around. And it was like ADHD in prehistory. And then it was like ADHD now. It was like, oh no, I have to go to my job. I can't focus on anything. And it's like, that's so true. Like in the past, it, like if you happen to have like somebody with ADHD born in your, in your tribe, it was like, we just won. We just won the civilization game. We got a God King. And it's like, oh shit. And like, I mean, like the same thing goes for trans people, right? Like there was a certain point in history where trans people were basically would be become priests, priestesses and whatnot and priests. Um, and it's like, it's, it's a lot of it is so much how we structure society in our society. We are it, completely rigid with the way that you are supposed to survive. And it's basically you get a job working for one of 10 corporations that exist and you do exactly what they want you to do or you die. Or, uh, or you have to be floated by somebody else who's running on the exact same treadmill. And um, I think that's terrible. That said, I think that ADHD gives me a fucking competitive edge on streaming. Not going to lie. Um, like, no joke. Like, I will have three three chats being monitored at any time. I'm very good at that. It's very natural to me. So I think, uh, like, I wouldn't give that away. And as for BPD, like, I don't know. I guess there's a little bit of an anecdote. But, like, my mom... And, and like most of my stuff that I dealt with, like with regard to family, um, like pain and abuse and whatever came from my dad. But my mom used to say that I had a heart of gold and, uh, and, and that was because like, I was hyper empathetic. I would like, if there was somebody like a kid hurt on the playground, I would be like, Oh my God, I can't think about anything else. We need to figure out what's going on. Oh my God, they're, they got a scrape like that kind of stuff. And that was because. Like, I mean, that is a very big trait that's associated with BPD. Like, that's hard for me to go. That's something that I consider a, a strength, something that allows me to write things and and understand people's perspectives. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, wish, I wish that we would adopt models that don't treat everything like a disorder necessarily, but just maybe a variant. Yeah. Of a, yeah. So. Sunny, please. Man, going after demon mom it's like i agree with like everything that she has to say about like living with bpd um that i it's it's also associated with um eating disorders uh this like hyper empathy in recovery they call it uh people feelers <laughs> which <laughs> but when like it's like when you walk into a room you can like tell like that person is like off um so I, I really, like, the value that I find in my neurodivergencies comes from the connections they've allowed me to make with other people, you know? And that, you know, I wasn't, I don't really consider myself born with mine. Like, they developed uh, through everything that happened in my childhood. Um, and I've, it's, I've basically been living that reality since my memory begins, so it's so hard for me to even conceptualize what life would be without neurodivergence, especially because it's present in like all of my family members. Like it's, we have quite the cycle of familial trauma in my family and it's, it would like, you know, have to go all the way up, like for all of, the, all of us being uh, neuronormative. But uh, h however, the physical impacts that my neurodivergence has had on me as like my BPD led to me developing an ED uh, as like a coping mechanism, which is very, very common with people who have BPD. Um, and the physical impact of that disorder is something that's like going to be life threatening for me for the rest of my life. And that's something that, you know, I wish that I never had to go through, you know, like that's, that's something that definitely <laughs> I, I wish could be cured. And a lot of people consider EDs as one of the ones that can be cured. You know, people, I think a lot of people kind of think of it that way. That's like when someone's like weight has stabilized or once somebody, you know, is consuming like the requisite amount of calories or, you know, whatever you think it is, they're, they're cured. Bada bing, bada boom. But it's, it's it's not it is also one of the ones that people have to live with for the rest of their lives so i i don't i i disagree with uh the conception of curing uh you know these things 
and that really I think they should be normalized and that people that live with these and or suffer from them or thrive from them that all of those experiences should be validated and normalized you know okay thank you uh yeah let's go to Montreal and then uh Mercy yeah I mean I guess on the on the on the topic of of curing it uh, yeah I mean as I mentioned before there's a bunch of things I would not want to get rid of right and uh and and I wonder sometimes I wonder if the whatever in my diagnosis it puts my cognitive ability that above the 99th percentile, which is great, right? But puts my working memory <laughs> very very beyond bottom of the scale, right? And I wonder if it's just a package deal, right? I wouldn't I wouldn't want the I wouldn't want the genius to go, right? But but the but on the other hand, it's like as far as as far as curing conditions, one thing I do work very hard on is the depression that came apparently comes with the with the you know effects of the of the adhd uh, someone mentioned it before the you know the person in the mirror is a cruel son of a bitch right uh looking at you criticizing you all the time for every little mistake because you you focused on these things and it's like and it's like you know as much as i mentioned the stuff that i like the the stuff that i don't like i i think i think curing it is definitely is definitely is definitely helpful because it's manifested in in harsh self-criticism constant self-criticism which needs to go that's not that's not something that's like that's not something that's like oh you know the environment is is bad or society's bad or something like that it's like no you need to you need to start you know th looking at things uh, in an optimistic not stop being so negative you know start changing your thoughts these these kind of treatments for things i don't think it's is just uh specific to to whatever you know quote unquote disorder you're dealing with i think people in general uh, maybe maybe it gives you a leg up because you may you make an effort to do things like like remember to you know look at look for positive things remember to ask for things instead of instead of assuming the uh, people's intentions remember to communicate your needs to people uh stuff like that which i think are, are, are valuable skills to anybody and which is stuff that that because of the adhd you know i've been forced to like you know, try to accentuate and work with, but I think they're, they're useful skills for anything. And, and in that case, in, if that's what's considered the cure, then I think it's enormously helpful and, and uh, probably not just for people with some sort of neurological condition. Um, I see. And Carol. Um, I, I love what you said about the person in the mirror being a, a cruel son of a bitch. Is that what you said? I, I love that. Yeah. I, uh, I am a very, very vocal advocate against transphobia in all its forms. And then I look in the mirror and my brain turns into Blair White like that, like that. <laughs> all right. So we, I like I get it. Right. Um, so I wanted to address this broader point about curing things uh, kind of in three short little different ways, uh, because I feel like there are three main categories of thing we're talking about right now. First of all, are the personality disorder type uh, neurodivergencies, which are often the products of trauma. Um, Obviously, we'd all like to have lived a life without our trauma. I think that is something that all of us share. You know, um, trauma sucks. And trauma is a lot more complex than one time you saw a bad thing happen. You know, trauma can be your entire childhood being, like, told you're not worth it by your parents or being uh, bullied at school or anything like that. You know, uh, it's, it's I, I wish we talked about it more in that way. Um, but those disorders can't really be cured, you know. You can learn to cope with the effects they have on your life and you can learn to live with them and have like healthy relationships and everything like that with them, but they'll never leave you, right? Trauma never really leaves you. Because, and, and so I don't think that curing something like that, but leading into my second point, you can cure uh, the effects of some things like that, right? You can cure uh, depression, which is comorbid with a lot of other uh, conditions, right? And a condition unto itself. Um, I would say that people with depression and anxiety who go on antidepressants uh, sometimes fear losing themselves, right? They, and this was true for me because for a long time it was a big part of like who I was that like, oh, sometimes I just don't move for days or sometimes I, I am so scared I can't leave my house, you know? And um, you fear losing yourself, you know? You're like, what will this do to my personality? But for the most part, antidepressants are super, like Lexapro saved my life. I would not be streaming right now if it weren't for Lexapro. I would be in my bed, uh, not going outside, still at like 
a BMI of 16.5 because I'm not going to the grocery store to buy food because I'm so scared of COVID, right? So we, we have to, like, medication for some of these really detrimental things to your life it is, is very, very helpful. And the third thing, I'm so sorry, Prime, I'm so, so sorry, is, uh, it, I always ramble on these, is uh, ADHD and autism and things like this, right, that are more in the neurodivergency category. And this is interesting. Um, I actually can't medicate for my ADHD because of the anxiety. I can't take stimulants. And because I have the trendiest disorder of all, irritable bowel syndrome, I can't take any of the other other medications because they'll fucking mess me up digestively, right? So uh, we... <laughs> We, we kind of reached an impasse with that, but I think that uh, things like Adderall can be very, very helpful by uh, to my friends with ADHD who do medicate, right? Um, people, I mean, it totally 180s their academic performance and things like that. So that should be looked into. As for autism, talk about autism is often extremely fucking eugenics-y. Demon Mama, you kind of hit the nail on the head with that one. People talk about like curing Down syndrome and autism in the womb or whatever. And I think that is really bad because we shouldn't be stigmatizing the existence of these people. What we should be doing is helping people with autism fit into society uh, in a in a better way and like kind of adapt more um, and and give them the accommodations that they need to make it through all of the stimulus that comes with life, right? We don't need to like genetically code our babies to be more. Uh... It's weird to me that we would structure our our children around society rather than structuring society around our children, you know. But I I cede the floor. Karana. Uh yeah, I think as a result of my neural divergencies, like I've had a lot of experiences that have been really really formative, but have also like. Now, I guess, like, I wouldn't want to change the fact that I experience those things, but sometimes, like, when I go on and live my life, I do worry that, like, I am generally making life a bit harder for others as a result of my neurodivergencies. Um, like, and a really formative experience for me was, like, in freshman uh, year, I was um, experiencing a lot of uh, just a freshman year of high school, sorry, just to specify. Uh, it was a really hard year for me, and um, I guess really like my autism was starting to manifest a lot because I recognized I wasn't really able to go ahead and say how I was feeling at all. So it, I was not able to explain to my family at all what I was going through. Um, and um, even now I have a really hard time of going whenever I experience assault, um, I it takes me forever to come to anybody and say, hey, this is happening to me and like, I need help. Um, and that was what was happening to me in my freshman year, but instead my parents just didn't understand. Um, and as a result, they thought I was being so defiant that I was kicked out of my house when I was 15. Now, um, am I happy I was kicked out of my house at 15? No, but also being kicked out of my house at 15 changed my life so much and changed my worldview so much that at the end of the day, it was a net positive, but also it's really traumatic. Um, now, whenever I go and visit like, you know, my family's home country, I have panic, panic attacks because I just think, oh, I'm trapped here and I can't leave. And it, it causes me to act really erratically every time um, we have to go back to the home country for funerals because instead I just cry all day or like sit in a corner just shaking because like, I'm now uh, my PTSD manifests in like being in the country scares me so much. Um, so at the end of the day, um, I really value living there. I value the experience, but also the fact that like um, as a result of me just not being able to explain to my parents, hey, I'm in danger right now and I'm being assaulted and I really need help. Instead, they saw it as she's just being a fucking bitch. <laughs> we need to have her leave. Um, so I guess at the end of the day, like, I value my experiences that I've had, but I guess right now I just sometimes am like, this is really hard, um, just because I do recognize that, you know, when my friends are like coming to me with their issues, I can't empathize with them like the way I, like they do with me. Um, and it makes me feel like a really bad friend, but I just don't understand when people explain their emotions to me. And I guess some people take value in that too with me. They're like, wow, you give a lot of pragmatic advice. But for me, I just kind of feel like a really awful person whenever like friends are looking for help. And, you know, with the ADHD, it's been really hard for school. So I don't know. I wouldn't cure it for sure, as it is really weird to just say, 
I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to go ahead and cure your personality. Is that cool? Um, and it is really integral to my personality, but I don't know, maybe I think life in general would be a lot easier without it. Um, not needing constant validation all the time would really help me with the, I maybe being a better leader. Maybe if I, it would help me definitely think more about myself. I'm so, I'm so needing validation all the time that I will do everything for everybody else because I don't care enough about myself. Um, Demon nine tails. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think there's, it's really interesting that, that like, I don't know, in our society, we talk about cures for everything. Our brains are not the same thing as an infection. Um, there's this really interesting uh, little metaphor that really helped me. One of the first things that helped me actually address my mental health in my like early 20s. And it was from, uh, I could tell you exactly who it came from. It was from um, a, um, a d developer at Riot Games, actually, who was um, talking on the uh, forums about their own struggle with depression. And they talked about it like a piece of wood and that um, depression can be so, sort of like a piece of wood that you're taking a knife and just sort of sliding it up against. And over time, a groove starts to build. And if you want to change that, you can't just twist the knife. It won't go anywhere. The wood's blocking there. You need to slowly and surely reform that. And all of a sudden, you've created a secondary path. And you can do all kinds of things from there once you realize that you can do that. This just the knife sort of carving in different things. And our brains are very much like that. Our brains are organic blobs, uh, electrical organic blobs. And they form to all of our different experiences and our, our living spaces and our social uh you know, mosaic that we that we live as, as a part of. The idea that you can cure anything like this is so ridiculous. And yeah, while you might be able to, to cure certain symptoms, I think it's better to look at perhaps certain symptoms for a cure. Like for example, if you have like a like a like a schizo affective or a schizoid uh, condition where that you have hallucinations, well, yeah, you might be able to cure the hallucinations, which is the one negative side effect that you might not have any benefits from. That's fine, but you can't cure a disorder. Like that's not how it works. Our brains don't have a bacteria that's in there that you take a drug and it gets rid of all the bacteria and you're good to go. It's your brain has become has changed its shape over time in in response to different things. It's a very um amorphous and nebulous thing and so I, I i always try to encourage people to not use that type of language when talking about mental conditions because i, I honestly like i don't want to sound like the, the the paranoid lefty on the panel who's always like but it just it just reminds me of nazi shit like it really does the way that like there's an obsession with like 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 curing x and curing this and like we need to cure we need to get this at like get this out of our bloodlines and it's like no that's not how it works our brains our brains are literally designed to respond to stimulus to evolve at a rapid pace um you know comparatively obviously it doesn't always feel rapid to us but to evolve at a rapid pace to things that we encounter and i just i i i it bothers me when people, and people do talk about that, by the way, about, about trans stuff that Marcy brought that up, that like people talk about like, Oh, would you cure like your transness or whatever? It's like, what do you mean? Like it's an integral who that's like saying like, I, I like, you just want to start over from square one. Sure. You want to reboot my life as with a totally different story. Yeah. No, it doesn't work like that. If I could make all the dysphoria go away, uh, maybe, maybe I'd be able to look in that, but guess what? I already know how to do that. Or at least I have a pretty good idea of how to reduce it. So maybe you should just let me handle that. And I think that a lot of that is um, like to, to bounce off again. Another thing that Marcy said is like, you know, we should, we should, perhaps look to build a society that is um a little more permissive of difference among individuals and you know heterogeneity um because um i think that even neurotypical people would probably benefit quite a lot from having a society that's able that people are able to flex and move around a little bit instead of everybody being sort of like jammed into this is my hole the amigara fault you know um until you pop out the other end like a noodle beast or something um, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I really try to advocate that like we build a society that is capable of, um, capable of, you know, giving people who are slightly different, a good life. And I actually genuinely believe that if we're able to achieve that, 
like we have no idea what what sort of potential we could unlock like we know that like i mean again if you even want to think about the stereotypes like we have stereotypes for every condition of people who are like you know uh, somebody brought up like the savant thing where it's like you could be incredibly good well why why should we build a society that by default punishes everybody who's slightly different instead of a society that could let that person self-realize and bring what they have to the table and i feel that way very much about myself as well like i'm lucky that i was able to find streaming and that it fits well for me but i mean i can think of a hundred other things that i probably could have done that would have been better if we didn't have this if we didn't have a system that was so strict and horrible uh nine tails and uh mercy and then Montreal. uh so yeah just uh just to Demon Mama's point real quick, I probably only caught part of it, but just want to remind everybody that like there is no therapy or like treatment that's in, in itself a cure, but like they can cure people. Um, and a lot of the times mental health and stuff like that uh, can have a lot more to do with someone's past or like uh, even like genetics than uh, whether or not they're getting this treatment. So I definitely would agree that like you can never expect a treatment to be a cure. Um, but at the same time, um, like for me, it's like we have to draw lines in places uh, and very, very strict lines. And like one of the big things for me is I hate electroshock therapy. I hate the idea that it like removes someone's agency to actually be able to cope with their own symptoms. It creates a cycle of dependency where as the effects wear off, they have to come back to this treatment. They lose their memory, um, which is like to me, like I'm pretty sure memory and mental illness kind of go hand in hand uh, just a little bit. And um, lastly, like uh, it's hard to like determine if like afterwards, after they get the electroshock treatment, like if they're able to act on like their concerns and stuff like that, because at this point they're they they'll even say they feel like a zombie, um, which. I'm sure electroshock works for some people who need it, but I think it's being over applied. Um, as far as like cures for like something like autism goes, what I hate about that discussion is that it puts all the burden on the victim to heal. Uh, I think that like the best, like the best cure that we can rely on is society itself um, accepting these people better and like losing the stigmatization of these sort of things because that in itself will be a much better treatment than trying to get somebody to conform to the way society already is. Um, obviously, if they could, they probably would have already. And uh, expecting that of people is just, uh, I think, a really selfish thing for the people who are trying to treat people that way. Um, so yeah, overall, I would say like, first of all, if you have any of these diagnoses or anything that makes you neurodivergent, don't feel bad about it. It's not your fault. Uh, a lot of the times it's, you know, it winds up being that society doesn't have a way for you to exist properly. But secondly, like if like, let's say you're a boss or something and like you have an employee that's like, um, you know, they're, I don't know what's going on inside my place, but uh, let's say they have like uh, an employee who has trouble focusing or whatever. Um, a lot of like the position that that boss has puts them in a position of power where they need to be like, oh, well, just don't be ADHD or you're fired. Um, Whereas I think um, in a better society, we'd see like it's a, it's the responsibility of the boss to facilitate the fact that that person's trying their damned hardest. And this is like what bothers me about capitalism, what it does to the worker with mental health, because like on one hand, like I'm sure like most people want to survive. I can't personally testify that like every single person with mental health is trying their hardest, but I'm sure most of them do. And then all they get compared to, they don't get compared to like whether they tried their hardest or whether or how much they're struggling compared to other people. They get compared to what was your output and how did how does your output look to other, compared to other people? And this is what bothers me about like society is like society doesn't see like, oh, this person is different. They must be having a harder time. They say this person is different. They're going to give me a harder time. Um, Where like if I like if have like I've had a few good bosses who just didn't make this an issue. But if all the bosses who I've had issues with, if they would just recognize that I was trying my hardest and I was struggling and that they didn't need to, like, come down on me 90 percent of the time, which only killed my motivation to begin with, um, then like things would have just been like so much better for both me and that boss, because like like my whole life has been like trying to explain to people like I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best just trust me and stop punishing me for what i can't do um and i really feel like like the sort of individualistic society we have gets people to think about like 
well, um, you're doing your best doesn't mean anything to me. Um, whereas if we had a society where doing your best meant something, people with mental illnesses would be a lot more able to work. Um, and they wouldn't be like reduced down to like, oh, how many profits are you making me? Let's go to Marcy, then uh, uh, Katarana. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's rough, right? With personality disorders, um, and I, this is true for personality disorders, but it's also very, very true for um, depression, which is a, a big one, right? Uh, rates of depression and anxiety are at an all-time high in the United States. Um, and they're climbing across the rest of the world too. And I, I think that um, as great as antidepressants have been for me and as great as they've been for other people, um, people are products of their circumstances. And when society is increasingly atomized, uh, loneliness is far more commonplace now than it was 50 years ago, bad as things were for folks like me 50 years ago, you know, um, at least people went and saw each other at church, you know, and people went and and hung out and there was kind of this forced uh, community type of thing, you know, and that was bad in some respects, but in other respects, like now we've got what the gig economy. So we've got a bunch of people who work jobs where they drive themselves around all day and, and are left with their own thoughts. You know, um, we've got a, a, a culture of productivity that fetishizes what you can do for society and asks nothing of what society can do for you um, or what you can do for you. Self-care is, is uh, on the one hand, commodified and uh, used to force you to buy products, and on the other hand, demonized by bosses who think self-care is cringe, you know, and you should be, all of your time should be dedicated to this company. Um, even independent content creators like me, me and some of the people here, you know, we have to slave away at this for, like, potentially no return, you know, we're doing something that makes us happy here, but the risk is so much higher than if we were to uh, go and do something that sucked our soul out and made us incredibly miserable, you know? And so I think it's no, it's no wonder that this shit is on the rise. It's no wonder mental health is in such a decline. And we can treat things like depression, anxiety, uh, you know, doom scrolling, this new phenomenon that's happening where people just scroll through all of the turmoil and death and fear in the world and they just think, oh God, oh God, everything constantly saturated with like negativity, you know? Uh, we, we can solve these issues with medication and with therapy, but if we really want to solve these issues at the root, perhaps we should look at the way our society is structured and, and work to fix that, you know, and and who am I? Uh, thanks, Ruby, for the five tier one subs. Who am I to say that as like a like a random Twitch streamer with no influence or whatever? But um, I do I do think that we should. Uh, we should push for progressive candidates and really hammer home in them the message that uh, education and the job market and all of these big, big fields where people spend so much time of their life should maybe be designed in a way that doesn't make people want to die. You know, I think that would help a lot. Um, I, I put a I put a large portion of the blame uh, for a lot of mental health issues on the Protestant work ethic and the the types of life that we are forced to live in. Uh, I'm sorry to say this late capitalism uh yeah Carana? yeah i guess on my end uh i can really see how just like the whole culture of, of work ethic has even in itself gone and influenced the manifestations of my depression um i am constantly at like a war with myself about whether or not i deserve breaks or if i deserve other things. So I've essentially had this environment right now in the past for like the last month because I haven't finished all the work I want. So until I finish the work I want, I refuse to open up the blinds. I haven't seen sun in a really long time. Um, and, you know, even uh, when I'm depressed to all hell, the way I go and, uh, you know, uh, take it out on myself is not, uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and have a day work to veg out. Um, no, I still need to work and I, I, uh, go ahead and hurt myself rather by, I'm not going to talk to anybody. So I just won't talk to my friends for weeks and people will text me and say like, Hey, and I'm like, Hey, I can't talk to you because I haven't done all the work I, I supposed to do. So I don't deserve to have friends right now. I'm sorry. I'll talk to you in a while. So I've had like some friends from high school that messaged me the entire year saying, Hey, do you want to talk? And I said, no, I haven't done my work. And now, essentially, I only hold conversations with people for the sole purpose of talking about work. I haven't had a friendly conversation with anybody in months. <laughs> I haven't had catch-up calls. 
I even had calls about how are you doing? Because I just don't feel like, you know, what do I get out of it? Because I have work to do. There's always things that I could be doing. Why do I? I don't deserve a break because there's always productivity to be done. Um, there's a, a really great thought slime video about essentially like even some of our hobbies, you know, when we're on breaks, it's still partially work. You know, I want to go take a break, but I'm going to have to make sure the break is used like exercise because exercise is something I need to do. So I'm going to go like to the gym rather than watch a movie because I only have one hour. So I need to use it losing weight rather than using it having fun, you know, <laughs> or something like that. Um, and I, I just uh, constantly do it to myself. And I guess as a product of uh, the NPD, like I just always need to try to find more ways in which I can do work in hopes that if I do the right amount of work, somebody will say good job on that work. And then that will go ahead and keep me going for a while. Um, so I guess for me, it's not even uh, a lot of my incentive to do things day in and day out. Uh, I guess stem from um, the system that we live in, in which you need to constantly be giving output. But honestly, I'm one of those people that I've done overpaid, uh, unpaid overtime so many times, just in hopes that the boss will say good job tonight. Um, and at the at the same time, it ends up affecting my mental health even more because you know sometimes I go ahead and do eight hour shifts and I say, no, I'm not going to take a break because you guys still need someone to be here right now. So I'm not going to take my breaks, uh, but, oh, I, you're paid to take breaks. Okay. Then you don't need to pay me because I, it's more important to me that I, I go ahead and help you and get the one compliment in the night. Then I go ahead and save my own sanity. <laughs> uh, let's go to uh demon. Um, and then uh nine demon. I didn't skip you before. Did I? Okay. Good. Well, demon. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you touch on that. I think because that touches on a, a sort of intersection with being a content creator. Um, these websites are designed to keep you on a constant treadmill and the treadmill adjusts the faster that you move. Um, and, and that's something that I've had to struggle with really seriously because I am a workaholic. Um, and I know that like, uh, that's something that like, I don't know where, which one of the, the parts of my mental you know structure it comes from but i know that that's the case um and the a lot of these platforms they like gamify things in such a way that like y you y y the more you put into it the more it asks of you and it, and it has made me realize like and not just this i realized some of this before some of it is what has made it possible for me to even cope with like having some success on this platform um on these platforms is is like one of the things that's helped me a lot is like gamifying parts of my life in my own special way like for example a really minor version of this there are various levels but a minor easy to describe one is we have this bell in our house it's like a little pig shaped bell and um it's called the the accomplishment bell and anytime you accomplish something anybody in our house you ring the bell, no matter how big or how small it is, you ring the bell because everybody hears the bell and everybody knows that you accomplished something. And you'd think that sounds really frivolous and silly, but it's a very physical, very mental thing that goes, ooh, I get to ring the bell. And it actually starts building you a little bit of that, that reward thing. It's like, it's like getting the compliment that you're looking for, but you control it. And it's, it's under your rules. It's a fair game instead of, um, you know, these bosses and, and companies that know that you want that, that know that you want that compliment, that know that you want that, that thing that feels good. The, and they, they, they put it, they put it on the end of a stick. So you keep chasing it down. Um, but there's all kinds of different ways um, that like, I think that neurodivergent people have to come up with unique solutions um, to, uh, you know, to, to the way that our society incentivizes things um like i mean i know that like god I, there's so many different ways i could i could go with this like i could talk about how like um some video games even like mobile games are almost designed in my opinion to prey on neurodivergent people by offering like games that that reward and and also incentivize like hyper focus and then they trick you into just you know, the more you hyper focus into the deeper you get in, the more, and then it's a sunk cost and then you're stuck. And it's like, they're almost designed to, to, to target people like myself 
or, or, or like some of the people on this panel. And it's like, it's, it's very strange, but at the same time, I also think that it's possible to, um, instead of like, again, to, to tie it back to the original topic, instead of looking to cure everything, instead to build structures that play more effectively and more fairly, um, with, with your unique brain. And that's why I said, like I described about like gamifying certain segments of my life. Um, there has been stuff that I do like that things like, um, like using really satisfying list lists. Like I love making lists and I love wiping things off of lists. And so I make lists out of everything now. And it's, it's super, super nice. It's like, it's actually, it, it helps to, um, you know, nobody else gets to decide what I put on the list and when I take it off the list, it's in my control. So that's sort of like taking back a part of my mind that I feel like this, like our society tries to take away from us in the name of like making us fit in and, and be cured. And I don't even think our society really knows what it would mean to be cured anyway. I don't know. Like, uh, Anyway, the whole thing is, I think that it's better to approach like relieving of pain and um, and thriving and and ideas like that as opposed to necessarily cures when it comes to how we choose language that we're going to use to describe things. Um, but it is hard. It's hard to, to 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 decide on these things because a lot of times it's not the neurodivergent and neuroatypical people who get to make the decisions on this. It's neurotypical people who study us from afar. Uh, you know, from like our, our little societal petri dish, and and that's a little unfortunate. But so yeah. that's what I wanted to say is the gamification stuff can really help in a society like this. Well, let's go to Nine Tails. I also want to check in with Sunny um, after Nine Tails, uh, in case you want something else you want to add. Um, and then after that, we can put Marcy in. All right. All right. So go ahead, uh, Nine Tails. I'm I'm actually uh, I forgot what I was going to say because I'm trying to figure out a bunch of stuff to do with my stream. So. Um, just skip me, and uh, I'll come back if I think about it. Uh, Sunny, uh, did you want to ask? Sure. The first thing that I want to say is that I love how, like, several people in the panel, like, smiled when Demon Mama brought up list. I love, I love just, like, the little, like, the happy, mm. like, thing that that <laughs> put into us. And that, like, there, there are some things like that about, like, neurodivergencies that I genuinely like, you know, that make me like happy, you know, like I love, look at this, look at it. Wait, let me get mine. <laughs> like, it, like, yeah, <laughs> this is, I list love it. Squad, list squad, list squad. I love it. <laughs> like this stuff is just like, like, oh, my heart, my heart just now is like, it's like up, like all my, it's like there's balloons in it. Because it's like, just now I felt like such, like such a camaraderie, like, oh my gosh, all these, all these folks get it. You like, you get it. And it's like, all these I, listers, <laughs> my listers, um, listers. And like, I, you know, I cherish that. I really do cherish that. And like, I am so thankful for communities that, you know, that like, like this one that we're taking place in right now that can like support these kinds of, you know, like happy moments, even when you know like neurodivergence and it's has often causes so much suffering for people um i think yeah that was like mostly what oh also uh after demon baba uh mentioned like the that uh knife in the wood uh metaphor that that's something that gets brought up in uh ed recovery that's like that's like the big that's that's recovery that's how recovery works yeah it's like it's neural pathways that like like the way that they taught it to us was um like a wheelbarrow. Uh, There's like an episode of the Bernstein Bears where that's like they taught that moral exactly in the same way, where it's like every day you bring your wheelbarrow out of out of the shed and you put it along the same dirt trail like in your driveway and you the same little thing until you create a a little road and every time that you force yourself to get out of it that you force yourself to make a new road you'll be more likely to do that instinctually the next time oh, that's, so that's a really good thing that's a really good thing to promote that's a great technique uh nine tails uh you maybe uh, remembered and my trial player did you want to say before that i just want to, my trial player yeah i'll say something okay uh go ahead uh, nine tails please yeah so it's it's really funny that everyone else here is huge on lists because um my upbringing and like my avoidant personality just sort of kind of makes that difficult for me. So like, uh, for one thing is like, 
I do not handle negative feedback well. Um, and that's a huge thing with lists for me. So it's like, I might make a list, but am I going to look at it when it comes time to to look at it? And, and am I going to continue to add things to it as I think of new things? Um, the thing is, is like, uh, I have a lot of things I could bring up actually, like with my complex PTSD and stuff like that. But like another thing I have is like dissociative personality disorder. So like I'll have an item pop into my head. That's like a list item. Uh, and I'll think like, or maybe I'll have like several. I'll think I need to make a list, but then I'll have another item pop in after I've gotten distracted by something and it will no longer occur to me that I need to make a, I need to add this to the list. Like it'll be just like, I, I will have just forgotten that I even make lists. Um, if that kind of makes sense, it probably sounds more dramatic than it actually is for me. But so it's funny, like how, like, I'm sure for like a lot of people with like uh, neurodivergency, making lists is super helpful. And it probably would be super helpful for me if I could actually like incorporate it into like my habits and behaviorisms. But like even in group homes, like I tried being a, like a listy kid and um, I'd like I'd like get like a, a journal and I get like a, a list to make and then I'd move. And that process would just like totally screw up any routine I've tried to develop for that. Um, and it it's weird, like if you would have told me like, oh yeah, moving all the time is going to prevent you from making lists. It's like, well, that's silly. But no, like actually like it really, like you start to feel like different people all the time. Uh, your motivation will get tanked just by not having like the consistency that like developing minds need. And now like, now like I make lists for like the panels when people are talking because I know I'm going to forget at some point. But like, like let's say like I make a shopping list, right? And when I'm at the store, and this is especially the case because I'm avoiding personality disorder, I'm not going to want to take out my phone to look at that list because I'm going to have like it's going to be a break in what I'm already doing. And my brain is already thinking at the entire time, just get the fuck out of there. So by doing something that makes me feel like I'm outing myself or like I'm doing something weird, because, OK, when I was a teenager, I did a lot of shoplifting and it's really easy to feel like people are watching you in a grocery store after you spent so much of your life shoplifting. I don't do it anymore. Just to be super clear, I'm, I don't do it anymore. Don't do not shoplift. Um, it was just something I did. <laughs> Have the and, statue um, limitations run out on your uh, previous? Uh, um... <laughs> probably have. I don't know what they are here in Can in Ontario for that sort of thing. Just messing with you. Go ahead, please. <laughs> but but yeah, like that that one like the fact that like I'm so situationally dependent on using that list, and like that list would actually be so helpful in all these situations, which make me avoid even using the list is. Just like this weird thing about myself that like makes it impossible for me to do that. Even though like, if you would have seen me as a kid, I was making lots of lists, but pretty useless lists at the same time. Oh, okay, uh, let's go to uh, Mar uh, Marcy and then uh, Montreal. Uh, I gotta respond to Demon Mama on this. Um, you were talking about how this kind of thing affects you as a content creator, right? One of the things that uh, was keeping me from streaming for a long time was sort of uh, this ADHD, you know, because I would I would stream like once in a while. And then, um, you know, because of everything intersecting depression brain and like the kind of uh, things like that would be like, oh, you're not like informed enough to go on this, like to, to do this as a career, you know, like what, what are you doing? Like people won't listen to you. People aren't going to take you seriously because you're a trans woman and like you, you uh, have ADHD and like you lose your train of thought all the time. And so what I've been doing to get better at streaming <laughs> is I've been gamifying stuff, right? Uh, so I will, when I wake up, uh, streaming, knowing that I'm going to stream gives me a reason to do my makeup and, uh, fix my hair and shower and be hygienic, you know, um, it on a day when otherwise I might lay around in bed all day. And that way, you know, if I have to go out to the store, I don't feel like a disgusting wreck. You know, I feel like a, like a woman who is out at the store, you know? <laughs> um, so that's, that's been great. Uh, I used to be really insecure about self-promotion. I used to be like, ah, oh, don't do that. People will think you're like a like a grifter, you know? Uh, no, nobody cares. Be aggressive with your self-promotion. Like, who cares, you know? You only live once. Um, and another thing was like, you know, uh, what I was talking about earlier where uh, society will kind of be structured in this way where if you're not a cog in the machine and if you're not doing something that's productive for someone else, you're uh, you're lazy, you know, you're not productive. Even if you're doing something like this, which requires, let's be real, a shit ton of work, you know, you're still, you're a leech, you're a neat, you know. Um, I, I had a situation with my IBS where uh, anxiety made IBS worse, IBS made anxiety worse, and I dropped like 20 pounds and I couldn't go to school for a month 
I'm in university. I can't go to school for a month. That's going to throw me completely off track, you know? So I'm having all this, all this crazy anxiety in my head. But yeah, um, like making a game out of stuff has helped immensely. Making a schedule that I have to stick to and like centering my meal prep and things like that around the schedule has been huge, you know? So a lot of like curing your issues isn't necessarily about like curing them, you know? It's about uh, making sure you have proper accommodation in your life to... Uh, you, you have space, you know, to, to learn and to grow and to um, live your best life, you know, that's, yeah. that's what's important. I wish that that's why, I'm, oh, not to get political on this debate panel. That's why I'm so in favor of like a UBI system, because holy shit, if everybody just had enough to eat, oh my God, we'd get so much good art. We'd get so much individuality and expression to, from people. The you art, know, and so I, the art. <laughs> yeah yeah no exactly we get so much good out of, out of uh, everyone would be able to live to so much more potential if we weren't like working or starving you know if i could if i could real quick um respond to what you were saying just one little at addendum to this back and forth we had on this particular issue um i've found like there's been a couple of things that have been really really meaningful and like have allowed me to actually do stuff i never thought i would be able to do before um which is like Okay, so when I realized that like I'm super forgetful sometimes and um and I'm also not just that but I'm like I was aware of being forgetful um like and and afraid of it and it would make me be afraid of starting things and doing projects because I'm like gosh, what if I start forgetting things and dropping it. Um I made when I started streaming, I made like this uh this web, like a thought web. It was like a really messy thing. And I just had like the biggest, most broadest goal I could possibly imagine. And then I broke it down from there and did little smaller goals. And I have this, this, this thing over by me and it's really messy and it's imperfect. But anytime I start to feel like a little like forgetful or, or, or directionless or like, Oh, am I making the wrong mistake? I can go back and look at this and go, uh, -uh now I'm like working on this little branch of the big picture. And it's like something you can go back and like burn it into your head that you can never forget. And it's, but it's yours, it's yours. And it's like helps so much with this kind of stuff. And that type of mentality actually like in it in what seems like a totally frivolous thing it actually made it possible for me to play a type of game i'd never like a video game that i never had been able to grasp before because it i had basically taught weird in a weird way taught myself a new skill that is necessary for playing like these huge uh i mean it's one of those games those like factorio style games like where it's just like oh god like and normally I would just be like, oh, okay, there's so much. I'm like, oh, oh, wow. And I'll get really interested in the mining the copper or whatever. But I was able to, because I like took this practice of building like a, a big picture goal, I was able to apply that to a game and actually ended up enjoying a game that I never would have been able to enjoy. So it's like a reverse process. I figured out something for work that ended up letting me enjoy an entirely new type of game. Do you, um, do you mind if I have one more thing really quick, Prime? Uh, just really, really quick. Well, both of you say really quick, but uh, a few minutes later. All right, well. I'm long-winded. <laughs> Go ahead, really quick, and then we gotta go to Montreal because he's been Oh God, okay. You you definitely remember this, Prime. Do you remember my first few appearances on here where I was completely disorganized and I'd respond to like the most recent point and I'd like ramble forever, you know? Uh, I used to be really insecure about that, but then I started taking notes <laughs> and now uh, now these debate panels are a hell of a lot easier, you know? Yeah, you, yeah, exactly. I tried taking it on like notepad, you know, and I was like, oh no, I can't do that much on a computer screen at once. That'd be crazy. So I, I just got a little notebook, you know? It's surprising how much like different approaches to the same issue can help. It's it's great. We love it. Um, uh, Montreal and then uh, Caron. There's so many things said. I wrote a bunch of stuff down. Another kind of disjointed, in some weird order. So this might not be linear. Um, first off, uh, someone mentioned about uh, maybe employers or people, you know, accommodating you in, in your best effort. I, I don't think it's fair. I, I don't think it's up to people to value your effort, even if it it, it would be nice. But uh, but uh, people spend energy time. Eventually, they'll they'll want to eliminate the sources of drain and and. and the fact is, is that if you're not, if you're not solving a problem for them, then you're creating a problem for them, and that's something they have to deal with, and they might be having their own issues, right? Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to impose that on anybody personally. That's just what that 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 resonated with me on that one. Um, however, I think the other thing that that uh, they came out to is uh, is as far as uh, I think it was a demon moments come. I don't, I don't even remember. I don't remember, but it occurred to me. How much talent is wasted because school filters out 
ADHD, autism, even just depressed people, right? And all this talent, all this talent. And, and if, if education taught us how to leverage these tools instead of, instead of just, you know, making them hit up against the wall, how much talent would, uh, how much talent and energy would we have access to? Right. But I mean, right now, the way it is, especially in like, I guess, uh, more technical, uh, more technical, more involved uh, professions. School is kind of a, a gatekeeping mechanism, right? But then it's also not geared to to take advantage of of people who are wired differently, and so they're just getting they're getting filtered out. And what you're getting is a lot of you're getting a lot of mundane people, right? And and they're the only people who have an opportunity to bubble up to the top because that's that's all the pool is made out of anymore. Right. Um, unless, unless of course you're someone who just happened to, you just happen to still, you know, fit into that particular game to play, but you know, that's not the case for, I guess, a lot of people anyways, but it's, it's, it is sad how much, how much potential we're probably wasting because our institutions are, are geared towards the standard human unit and not, and not, uh, you know, taking account that, that there's a, a, diaspora of people right uh, out there and and amazing talents right like the all these i just think about myself right but i mean like school was so hard i still finished two degrees right but but it was so difficult and so uh, miserable for me i was so happy when i left and you know what i despite getting two degrees right now i support a family of four i make a very good living and i do it in some in nothing that touches any of the degrees i had at school right it's 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 yeah anyways it's just it's i'm lucky i'm lucky that i got into a profession that didn't really require that kind of uh, that kind of uh, you know uh, certification but it's like the talent and intelligence was was there but you just because of the system you have that that just kind of standardize everything you just kind of you wasted it right and i got lucky that i still fell into somewhere comfortable but i i, I know a lot of people who you know despite being very intelligent being very talented having all these things that are going for them right they couldn't make it past this gatekeeping and keeping mechanism you know with a good score or something and it kind of it led them it led them down a path where they don't have a lot of opportunities and it sucks because that talent could have been used it could have been put to to, to use in our in our society um i don't think as far as like as much as i hate education for not as much as I hate our educational system for not accommodating people, I just don't think it's, I don't think it's structured or equipped to, to do it. Like, like you only have, uh, I don't, I don't think we're, we have the, the kind of institutions that can handle like multi-layered approaches to, uh, you know, a large number of people and, uh, whatever. I mean, that's it. So standardizing things and making things kind of common to people is the enemy of of this kind of diversity uh, at all points. And I think it's something to uh, that's something to think about when when you want to think about how to restructure things and making like one system that's good for everyone. And I would encourage you to think about making a mul a cluster of multiple little systems that accommodate pockets of people, uh, because uh, yeah, the the one size fits all approach is 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 a recipe for disaster in my opinion uh i think that there's a bunch of other stuff but other people want to talk and i think that's it it's i'm all already i'm already all over the place uh i okay i know this is a, a i shouldn't say this but i thought you said one sides this all um and i don't know that was a lot more <laughs> we could fist all sure. <laughs> sure i'm not gonna judge not into that personally but yeah, whatever uh, okay well that, that's it's just me no nope, that's me my, my own thing all right cut around on the night Eight mandated fisting is that what's happening? you hear what you want to hear mm, yeah. prime i don't know this is, uh, well, <laughs> uh cut around on nine tails uh marcy Hi, my name is Prime. I'm like 12 years old. Ha ha. Sing me. She said 69. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> um, I really like that you guys touched on UBI just for a little bit because though it wasn't probably created in this type of way, um, we've been having, uh, you know, the government uh, direct deposits in uh, Canada for like the last uh, like eight months. It has saved my life oh my God. <laughs> so fucking much. Like, oh, like the only reason why I was able to get any of the medical attention that I needed this year was because we had this. I typically, like every exam season, because of all the stress of like me having to work to still continue paying the bills while also doing it, I, I kind of have a bit of a, uh, 
a stress uh, triggered uh, IBS myself. So I every like exam season, I end up dropping like 30 pounds because I can't actually hold any of the food in my body due from all the stress. But like this year, I only had one day of it <laughs> because I was like, I don't need to work. There's UBI. <laughs> so I was just like, like I would have canceled my shifts. I was like, Lel, fuck you. I'm not coming. I can't like my tummy don't like you, KK. Bye. Um, and that was really, really nice. Um, and I also like have been able to like pay for, you know, therapy every week because of UBI. And yeah, it's like, it's really good. Why have disability when you can just have fucking UBI? Like, man. <laughs> I'm in the completely same boat with like living in Canada and receiving that, that it oh. was that funding that allowed me to start ED recovery and get into that program. Like after like eight years of that. Yeah. And like, even for myself, uh, whenever I get the um, kind of like triggered IBS, it kind of flares up like ED for me too. Cause I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm dropping weight. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I, don't need to, I don't need to put food back in. It's fine. Like this, this yeah. good summer bod. Yeah, the gremlins show up and they're like, good job, you did great. Yeah, yeah, like literally, like having a uh, diarrhea, girl, you look beautiful, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you cut it on it. I, I don't want you ever to feel shame for that, all right? IBS is a girl boss trait. We should all encourage that. <laughs> yeah, first day, I'm like, you do realize you're going to have to buy a toilet paper for me. <laughs> uh, Gaslight, girl boss, gastrointestinal issues. Gaslight, gatekeep, gastrointestinal <laughs> Yeah, but like... Uh, it, it's just yeah it was really nice I was able to pay for therapy and then like this this time around when I was starting to like drop weight I was able to just say oh I have excess income so I'm going to go ahead and order like uh, one of those food meal uh, kits that essentially forces me to at least cook and like I can't say oh like it's too hard because literally it says it takes 20 minutes to boil water okay and like yeah it's been really helpful um and then yeah just a uh, part of the whole thing uh I'm moving backwards quite a few steps because I, I had to take notes a little bit too. Um, where, yeah, uh, neurodivergency um, in university um, has been really hard. And I think it also translated to like me taking a little while to go ahead and stream because uh, I have really mad, bad imposter syndrome as a result of the fact that like um, university, uh, like, bosses will essentially try to keep up morale and say like if you're really doing a good job they'll say good job and damn do you need to fucking do crazy shit for them to say good job but school no one's gonna say fuck all to you like no one's gonna say good job no professor's ever gonna say that was a really good question nothing so like i just honestly most of the time just think i'm an absolute idiot in all my classrooms all the time and um as a result you know a lot of the stuff i want to do here in the twitch space is science communications but i also like just feel too stupid most of the time to like go ahead and talk about it so you know some people will say like let's talk about your research i'm like oh yeah research anyways like what's going on with you because i just don't feel like smart enough to actually go ahead and talk about you know months of my life's work <laughs> And it, yeah, it, it does get really hard. So I, I just was trying to lead it back to like, Marcy, I, I totally understand uh, what you uh, mean when you're saying like, oh, like, it took you a while to get on Twitch because like, it took it took me a while too. And like, most of the, honestly, I was just playing video games and like, I would try not to talk because I was too worried, like my voice would crack or all the other things that happened. <laughs> mm. Okay. Thank you. Um, my, uh, let's go to uh, Nine Tails, then uh, Marcy, um, and then maybe we'll. Uh, oh, and then Montreal, because you said you, you had other things to say. I want to make sure you get them out, um, right? You said you might have other things to say, but I want to make sure if you have anything else, I want you to get, get that out. So Nine Tails, Marcy, and then if Montreal has anything he wants to add, then all right, and might think of wrapping up after that. Yeah. So. One of the things I think about a lot about my life is like the effect of isolation I had. Like you think living in group homes would mean that you're not very isolated. And it's true. There are definitely situations where you should be isolated when you're not. Um, but generally speaking, the the positive social interactions are not significant enough and frequent enough to overcome like the the sort of effective isolation you get uh from that and it certainly screws up your ability to integrate into normal society when they have a completely different set of social skills uh i think when we look at like how people with like say asperger's or autism develop in the world we we 
can think a lot about like how kids kind of demonstrate to each other proper behavior because they're not actually saying like this is what you can expect from the world so like you'll both simultaneously get like judgments from just generally everybody for being weird but then not get those judgments from your friends just because they're your friends even though it's the same thing and i think like most people just like kind of like in subconsciously internalize this and like cat, uh, categorize like those people aren't my friends they're going to judge me for almost anything i do um, these people are my friends they're only going to judge me when i'm being an actual idiot but like growing up when you're autistic it kind of creates like uh, especially the isolation it creates just the sense that like everyone's secretly evil and people are only being nice to you because they're your friends um and i think like one of the worst things that like came about for me uh with like being isolated was that certain things like manifested health wise that I never talked to anyone about. Um, so like my IBS uh, was a big thing, but actually IBS it's, I don't even know if I should call it IBS anymore. Cause now I know that it's just specifically lactose intolerance and celiac disease that is definitely coupled with stress. But um, like for the longest time, I actually thought it was kind of normal to feel that way after eating like I did, like, uh, for those who don't know, autistic people tend to have weird eating patterns. So, like, I eat very fast, I eat very, like, almost compulsively fast. And, um, like, I also kind of, like, like, I don't chew enough, if that makes sense. I just swallow things and they'll be like, oh, that was too big to swallow. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it other than that. Um, <laughs> that sounded so bad. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, going back to the point is, like, I feel like, well, first of all, like, having that like sense of reference outside of yourself is huge but also uh the world really doesn't like we don't like prepare ourselves growing up for like to be like someone's other like how would i put it like um someone's keeper like for me like a lot of my self-care stuff would be a lot more easily managed by somebody else um i just suck at self-care and it's part of my dissociative and avoidance stuff and uh Literally, like, there, I'll have, like, months where my brain's just telling me not to brush my teeth because it'll feel too painful or whatever, even though I know it's a lot worse to not brush my teeth. So I do. But, like, the fact that that's there is very significant. And it's easy to feel like that's normal when you don't get to talk to anybody else. Um, it's also easy to feel really, really fucked up for not being able to do it on your own when it appears, and keyword appears, like, everyone else's. Um, and, like... I'll I'll just come out and say it like I'd be much better off in a healthy but codependent relationship where someone understood my needs, understood like my shortcomings and like, you know, what's kind of like preemptive because uh, it's very easy for me to just fall into like a habit or like a like a, a certain routine that's like something like uh, writing a video essay. Then I forget to do literally everything else at that time. Um, just like I just detach from it that it even exists. Um, so it's it's it gets to be pretty bad uh and like stress can do like kind of the same thing but worse because now i'm not preoccupying myself i'm literally just detaching from these things for no reason and it's so hard to like reach out in like the dating scene knowing that at some point you're going to have to break to this person like hey i kind of suck at life and i need someone to help me out with it um <laughs> you know and i don't i don't want to date people for that reason but i also wish it was easier to find somebody who like, I don't know, understood that some people need that and wanted to be there uh, for that. Okay. Um, uh, Marcy and then uh, Montreal, if you have something to add. No, Marcy? No, no. Oh, you're, uh, you're muted again. Also, Katarana, uh, also girl what? boss behavior, the, the muting, of course. <laughs> I know, girl boss behavior, it's true. Always be girl boss and learn that from the best. <laughs> Uh, gaslight, gatekeep, girl boss. Okay, Katarana, I think you uh, are really onto something with that, uh, what you said about, like, starting off streaming is really hard, you know, because you don't feel like you're very entertaining or interesting or whatever, but I learned, uh, I'm not gonna drop any names or anything, but uh, due to a certain streamer I've got some, <laughs> I've got some beef with, all right, I learned that uh, you actually don't have to be that entertaining or interesting. People will watch you do anything. You can just fucking sit there and play video games. You can fucking play League of Legends and talk to your friends and bullshit. You can just like chat with your with your chat, you know? Even if you have like 13 people, you can just talk to your chat. You can fucking, uh, you can just like browse Twitter, you know? 
People that you can fucking eat a burrito on stream. Nobody gives a shit. All right. People show up for the <laughs> for the experience of the stream, you know. And I feel like that's a lot of new media, right? People don't feel start uh, comfortable starting it because they're like, oh, what will I? Like, I'll be, uh, <laughs> I won't be interesting enough. But fact is, most of us are pretty damn interesting. Everyone on this panel, I, I, I feel like I could have, like, a two-hour conversation with. I feel, you know, I'd watch most of you uh, just chill and vibe and eat and talk to your chat, you know? So, I, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's the dilemma we all go through. Um, Ninetales, you're saying something about, like, like, constantly doubting yourself or whatever, you know? And um, uh, for you, what was it? It's, like doubting your ability to be in relationships. Um, for me, it, for a long time, uh, my grandma and my mom and my dad all had this habit of like, uh, kind of attributing things to me, like intentionality that I wouldn't like attribute to a child in terms of like things I would do that were weird or wrong or whatever. So I grew up thinking like, oh God, something's wrong with me. So all throughout high school, whenever I'd feel an emotion, I'd be like, nope, this has to be fake. I'm a like emotionless sociopath who just like does things for myself because that's what I've been told so nope this this emotion's fake and I just have this constant internal dialogue of like you're a bad person you're a bad person you're a bad person and that is so like amplified by the factors around us and the people uh, uh to go back to the the conversation we were having on the first topic you know uh who stigmatize these things and who treat it like it's a personal failing to uh have this this trauma and this kind of uh these conditions that can really rule your life if you allow them to and a lot of people, you know, they hide that in alcohol or, or pills or other things like that. And um, it, it's really, really unfortunate. Um, I wanted to speak to Montreal really, really quick when you said you think it's unfair for, just to clarify, were you saying you think it's unfair to expect people to accommodate you? I think it's unreasonable to expect that uh, from people just because uh, like, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe on a, maybe on a instance per instance basis, but not on a long-term like consistent thing. Eventually gonna, uh, the drain of energy is just, people are going to drop off and, and disengage with, with whatever relationship. If it's, if it's constantly causing a problem for them. That, you're that's right. I mean. uh, you're right. All right. But I, t for two different perspectives, right. In terms of employment and school and things like that, Expecting people to accommodate you in that, um, I think that the burden of that being placed on individuals is in itself a flaw with the system, where we expect the person directly above us to accommodate us instead of the like the system itself being structured in a way that it can accommodate more than just the like default uh, person that we're told is is like the the correct type of person. You know, I think that's true of school and and to a large extent uh, employment. You know, uh, and I think that those things can be addressed largely through policy. But um, when it comes to interpersonal relationships, I agree there has to be a give and take. And that's why I'm a big advocate for cognitive behavioral therapy. I think that going and, and having somewhere where you can talk about these things uh, with a person and, you know, get all of this out on the table and, and not be holding onto it constantly, um, especially, I mean, couples therapy is huge, you know, um, trying to treat your friendships uh you know uh going to therapy to kind of internalize the idea that your friends value you and you're not a burden on people's life or whatever that that's great you know and uh it doesn't have to be seen as a cure and it doesn't have to be that person constantly accommodating you or whatever it can be you know you growing and and i, I think that that's important right i don't want to say like just sulk and live with your problems because that is pretty harmful too but i there, there does have to be a push and pull and i think that if you're going to be in a relationship with somebody who has this kind of a a thing, you know, or, or someone who, because more and more people have, have severe trauma, you know, uh, the statistic about women who are sexually assaulted, um, the statistic about people who grew up in abusive households, you know, it's, it's, it's off the charts. Things are getting worse for people. I think we should be cognizant of the fact that our partners might, uh, have some sort of issue. And, and I think that we should be, be there for people. And if it becomes too hard for us, that's fair too. But, you know, I, I think that we have to have these conversations and not kind of hide it the way that, um, our our parents did montreal i think uh, i mean whatever just to go back to to the thing you asked me about it's just it's more like I mean, i'm just trying to explain this differently i suppose but it, it's more like if you yeah if you have a relationship where both parties aren't extracting some form of benefit from it like at all times right then then if when one of the when one of the sides stops doing that the relationship tends to it tends to dwindle, and if that's an employment relationship or a personal relationship, any any I guess any transactional thing between two parties. If both parties aren't extracting some sort of some sort of benefit out of it, then then I, I it's, understand. It's just, 
dwindle and i don't think it's it's i don't think it's reasonable to to expect that that people entertain a relationship that becomes one-sided at one point that's all i understand what you're saying but at the same time i think we have to be careful that we don't slip into this kind of like cut the toxic people out of your life mentality because that shit is i would say just as harmful as holding on to abusive relationships you know you can keep yeah, somebody no, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a you can keep somebody at a, at a safe distance from yourself um to to still like maintain a relationship but give them space to grow without necessarily being like i am ending this relationship i am drawing the line in the sand sometimes you have to do that but i think uh we're told to do that too quickly sometimes that's yeah it, that's not quite the angle it's more like i mean i guess the the criticism i have towards employers and in, in, in academia or or, or, or institutions of, of learning and stuff like that is that uh, is that uh, I guess we're not uh, you know we're we're not really geared to we're not really geared to to leverage to leverage the talents that people have right and to uh, to we're not very I mean I guess we're not accommodate or yeah I guess the the way we're educated I kind of said this before right but the way we're educated yeah you know, doesn't leverage the the talents that we have and basically a lot of people fall by the wayside right if uh, if the the individual or even the employer or whatever institution uh you know came at it with an attitude of oh well you know this person's this person's brain is wired this way and therefore I can I can use them better in in this capacity if both parties knew that and could communicate those needs we'd have better things I mean like we're not there I feel like that's the kind of thing to work on but just uh, just like a one-sided keep things the way they are but tolerate this other person's kind of drain on your time and resources i oh, find oh. that way is unreasonable that's all my, I, my I just, issue I is that it ask. falls um in, in education really quick my issue is that it falls on the teacher to make classroom uh, accommodations now and i don't think that should fall on the teacher i think that the system from the ground up should be constructed in a way that everyone can contribute something productive regardless of where their talents lie i, I don't think that it's it's good for us to require that of these overworked underpaid people who teach our kids yeah, no, I don't I, think I've got to ask. Um, so for someone like me who's already described that, like, I can't just have regular relationships with people because I'm I have too many needs and they end up becoming relevant when it's someone like a boss or a partner. So should I just not have these relationships, according to your logic or, you know, no. like because like I, no, I'm it's, often it's forced. Can I just can I say really quick? I'm often forced to make myself vulnerable. These people who have some sort of power over me, especially bosses and say, like, look, you're in my faults. Uh, here's what I need. And they can say, well, I just don't want to give you that, so go away. Um, I think it'd be better if they couldn't. I think it'd be better if they had to accommodate these these needs. That way I couldn't just be fired for being too difficult for them. Um, so I, this is this is the only problem, and I'm sorry if I'm getting you wrong, but like, how can we not take the logic this far? Right. No, I, I get it. I get it. Um, uh, yeah, no, if, I mean, I guess the way I think about it, it's, it's unfortunate that we're, we're structured in this way. It should be changed going forward. If you're building your own systems, you know, uh, take it into account because it, it'll fall in. And I'm just saying if, if, if what we, if what we should do, or if what you would force people to do, right. It entails uh, engaging in, in a relationship that's not mutually beneficial, right. Uh, to one side, because they have to accommodate it for the sake of, of being, I guess, fair or whatever you want to call it. I, I just don't think, I don't think those kinds of relationships are, are actually sustainable. I mean, what would really happen? Well, yeah, what would really happen? I mean, ideally what would happen is that is that your employer would understand that, that you're wired differently. You would have understand you're wired differently because it would have been caught at some early age and you would have learned to to leverage and work with that and, and then bring those talents to the table. I mean, that's clearly not, that's clearly not what we have today. I just, uh, I guess the, yeah, the the way the the way it was framed just just triggered in my head like oh that sounds like a it sounds like kind of a lopsided unsustainable relationship uh, structured that way in terms of like just like I don't know you know uh, accommodating well, it might be someone inherently, because... but like that's the beautiful thing about love right is like if so, like I definitely become very loyal and dedicated to a person and I can't just assume that the other person is going to be the same as me but I definitely if I love someone enough I would accommodate their needs just to be with them and i think it's not too much to demand uh the inverse uh so long as you've developed that relationship my point was that like i want to get to that point where it is uh mutual and it is commensal uh sorry not commensal um i can't think of the right word but it, but it is like <clears throat> not, not necessarily beneficial but like 
um, consensual, I guess. And so, like, that's like that's my thing is like it's hard to get from like it's hard presenting like this header like this uh, non divergent part of myself up until a certain point, and then being like, oh yeah, by the way, uh, I have all these flaws you probably only partially notice, and here's what they all are, and hopefully you still accept me. Um, whereas I think if we didn't have such an individualist society that focused on like the self as being like the end all be all of our existence, it'd be a lot easier to say like, okay, well, my personal feelings about this um, don't detract from like overall, like the relationship that we have. And so therefore, like, I don't need to like change things just because this information is unsettling to me. I also think it's just like, bad to think about relationships in terms of like both people being able to get something out of it i don't think that's why people enter relationships uh like subconsciously and i think like as a social species if we actually try to do calculus that way we're just going to end up hurting each other okay uh, uh why don't we do this <laughs> um i think it's actually really interesting <laughs> something we've stumbled upon here um but um i, I want to respect everyone's time uh who's here right um, so why don't we uh, do uh, like the final statements and, you know, um, and, and give ourselves outros and uh, yeah, and we'll cut off. So my audience members, my audience members, so, uh, the content does not end here. Uh, we will continue on to our open walk on panel, open walk on panel where audience members like you, yes, you uh, may be a part of it. So we want to uh, do like, you know, if you want to continue this conversation there, it's fine. Uh, or we can talk about something else. Uh, but yeah, the content um, is not... Um, this end here, the stream's not over. All right, so why don't we start um, in reverse order? Uh, we'll go with our friend Sunny there at the bottom. Um, yeah, Sunny, um, any last words on this? And tell people about yourself. Um, uh, I guess, firstly, I had a great time with all of you. Um, kind of like one of the big things I've taken from uh, my personal recovery, uh, my, my journey, um, as like that near and dear to my heart is um one of the philosophies of uh ed recovery which is you know kind of can be used for like most recoveries i think is uh the concept of shared humanity you know it's coming to learn that there are other people going through the same thing you're going through and that it is a fundamentally human experience that it's it's not you know it's not broken it's not wrong it's it's human, you know, this is what our brains do. This is how we form. Like, this is the stimuli, this is the effect. And I've, I've just always loved thinking of it that way, you know, that it's like, I, you know, like how like Demon Mama was talking about that, like, and like back in the old days, like if you had ADHD, you were like, you were the star of the show. Um, I, that's the way I like think of it. That's like, you know, humans come in every, every kind of brain formation out there, every kind of mushy blob of mass in your skull. And that I, I, I love that. <laughs> I love that. Even, even though it's caused me so much suffering uh, and so much pain, it's still me and I love it anywho. <laughs> and I'm so happy to get to hear all of your stories and experiences and share our humanity. It has really, you know, filled my heart with helium balloons. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to shill. Uh, just like Prime show, go and watch. It's like follow, follow Prime, subscribe to Prime. Um, I show up every now and then. Um, and thanks, thanks for listening. Thanks for giving me some space. And let's not all forget that Sunny is our current stream queen, as it says right there on the bottom of your screen. Um, <laughs> uh, Sunny um, was uh, kind enough to uh, be part of our primetime around, which we'll have again this Saturday. Um, so come back for that one or the other. But thank you. All right, next we have Demon Mama. Demon Mama, um, thank you definitely for, for being part of this. Uh, it was. Uh, fun. Um, and it was uh, uh, fun. Uh, fun is like a weird word. Um, but it was it was great. I had fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, it was really fun. great hearing your perspective on this. This is like it's a pretty serious topic, but um, like uh, I think you added a, a lot to this. Um, and we, and it wouldn't have been the same without you. So thank you.
I oh, appreciate that a lot. Um, yeah, my, once again, my name is Demon Mama. You can find me at this website that's right right down here. It's demonmama.com. Uh, all my links are there, and you can come hang out. Afterwards, I will be doing a brief Q&A. You can come ask me things if you want to poke my, you know, poke my brain about my experiences with being neurodivergent and uh, many other things. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to do some debate review, stuff like that. So feel free to swing by if you liked uh, my stuff and follow and whatever. Um, I will say... As the perhaps the definitive statement on whether on the 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 topic that we were just talking talking about, I think that we should test this like Ayn Rand style, okay? And we should have all neurodivergent and neuroatypical people go and make a Galt's Gulch, and we'll see just how far society gets without us. Because I have a feeling that there's going to be a whole lot less streamers, a whole lot less musicians, a whole lot less video game creators, a whole lot less political analysts, rocket scientists, medical scientists, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think society is going to do so hot if we decide to make neurodivergent gulch over here. Okay. So yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. And uh, that's a little bit of a meme, but honestly, it's been absolutely wonderful talking about this no, with all sorry, of you. A uh, true pleasure. Okay. Uh, next, um, Marcy. Marcy, yep. thanks you also for coming through and adding oh. to this. It's always, um, great to have you here to participate um yeah so uh marcy uh last words on this and tell the word about yourself thanks for having me prime uh, i i do feel like i ramble sometimes on these panels but you know what we're getting better at that so uh eventually we'll be able to engage in true intellectual discourse uh yeah so i just i i left uh to go feed my animals but in terms of like the one-sided relationships talk um i find that i, I noticed this a lot in discussions of like being trans also um, when we talk about these things, when we talk about relationships between trans people or between people who are neurodivergent or like anything like that, we often think of it in terms of one person who is the thing and one person who is the norm because we have internalized the idea that cisgender and heterosexual and neurotypical are the norms, right? So we think of this as one person who uh, who drains the relationship and one person who has the draining done to them, right? And there's this great book called Conflict is Not Abuse um, that I think goes into this in, in, in very, very good detail, how relationships aren't always about the abuser and the wronged one, you know, relationships are, are often a give and take. And I find that a lot of neurodivergent people, a lot of people with personality disorders, a lot of people with trauma in their past tend to find each other because we, you know, it, it does something to people where they're drawn to the same kind of uh, activities, maybe they're they're drawn to the same social circles. Um, and, and we find each other, you know, so I, I would just hesitate to always be talking about things as if like the, the, the perfect way to be is like totally neurotypical and able to take on any of life's challenges uh, with a smile on your face, because I, most people and even more so these days are not like that. Right. Uh, the majority of the time you're the person you're with is, is going to have some sort of, uh, some some sort of thing that they're suffering with whether they talk about it or not um and definitely in employment situations if you're an employer some of your employees are going to be severely mentally ill uh, or neurodivergent or you know have, have a whole host of uh, physically ill anything like that and i think that we should as a society be able to accommodate people from all walks of life um but yeah i uh i'm i'm marcy uh i stream on twitch sometimes i i do these panels uh sometimes they're a lot more blood than, the, than this one was, you know, this was pretty friendly. But uh, yeah, I do these, uh, I do debates, I do um, video game streams, I sometimes just hang out with my chat and get high and kick back and enjoy life, you know. Um, <laughs> that's, the, that's the uninteresting streaming we talked about earlier. Uh, you can find me at Twitch at twitch.tv slash girlbossmarcy and at YouTube at the same. Um, also my Twitter, which uh, is, is, is <laughs> just banger after banger after banger, if I do say so myself. Uh, Demon Mama, it's been great to talk to you. I have a lot of respect for you as a streamer. Um, everybody else here, great to meet you. Katarana, it's literally always a good time when you're on the panel. I uh, always got to show up for Katarana. Love, 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 <laughs> love that bitch. We love her. Uh, Prime, good to see you. Get some moisturizer. Mm. All right, I have nature's or moisturizer, so I'm good. I'm good to go. Thank you. Um, yeah, you keep believing that, buddy. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, next, Nine Tails. Nine Tails, so I was very happy to have. I uh, join us in this uh, conversation. We actually had a, um, when Katarana came up with this, I, I, I remembered that uh, Ninetales 
uh, and I like did a whole impromptu neurodivergent stream a few months ago. Um, just happened to be the case, you know, and other people were there and we joined in. We had a really good talk. Um, so I was happy that uh, she joined us uh, today. Thank you, uh, Nine Tails, and tell us if you have anything else to say. Yeah, thanks, Prime, Prime for having me. Uh, I'm Nine Tails Cosmic Fox, currently streaming, which is still like I, I'm still in disbelief whenever I realize that. Um, yeah, so I, you probably know me from Prime's uh, stream. You can follow me. Uh, hopefully, Prime can actually shout me out this time uh, at twitch.tv slash ninetailscosmicfox. And the nine is spelled out there, just to be clear. And uh, I have a Twitter, too. I'm going to paste that in there. It's M9Scarlet, the letter M, the number nine, and Scarlet with two Ts. And you want to follow me because, A, I'm going to be doing morning shows. B, I'm going to be the next stream queen. And C, Demon Mama's time slot is under threat because of me. So uh, I'm going to start taking all of her followers. Uh, and so you're going to want to be there to see that because there are going to be drums. Just kidding. Love you, Demon Mama. Um, I really like science and stuff, uh, so I'm guessing that we're going to be talking about like urban ecology and like some political stuff and how they all relate and intermingle. Um, I'm going to be making my own synthesizer, uh, so if you want to learn how to do electronics, like make your own circuits and stuff like that, it's going to be like we're going to start from the bare basics, baby, and we're going to make that synthesizer. And I hope it inspires you to make your own and we can all make wonderful music together that will be open source and usable on Twitch. Um, so other than that, uh, I'm planning on making some video essays and uh, I'm super awkward. So just follow me, I guess. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks again for having me on. Follow Prime, uh, subscribe to Prime. Uh, he works super hard, harder than I probably will. So um, yeah, send, send, send some love that way too. <laughs> Uh, Nine Tails, that stream sounds amazing. I like that uh, idea of like a maker's stream, you know, um, and it's something I'd like to learn how to do too. Um, I might have to check that out. Um, everyone, right on. Yeah, uh, Nine Tails' link is in chat as long as uh, everyone else's. Um, next, uh, Montreal Player, Montreal. Uh, thank you uh, so much for coming through and sharing, especially, you know, what's going on with your, uh, with your family. Um, yeah, it's really kind of you to you know share those personal details and um make the, enrich this panel uh with your experiences so uh, thanks anything else you want to say well uh thank you for having me yeah those those details have dominated my life for the last few months uh whatever i'm happy to come come out and talk about them uh my name's montreal player on on twitch you can call me monty you'll usually find me smoking joints in my garage talking to various people um yeah that's it i'm uh i'm a localist uh which essentially means i guess the closer you are to me the more communist i am and the further you are from me the more libertarian um yeah uh, it's, that's it i'll usually talk about uh i don't know i'll usually talk about uh, crypto growing your own food um uh, adhd stuff and uh and generally uh how to how to build fruit, fruitful relationships with people. And I talk, I like, I like talking about first person experiences and usually try to relate anecdotal evidence as to my life, because it's the only thing I'm truly an expert on. Um, that's it. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for everything. Great panel. Okay. Um, and last, but absolutely not least, uh, the woman who put this all together, um, Katarana, it was her idea. And, uh, she, came up with the uh, questions and uh, she did a fantastic job out of uh, all out picking excellent guests um, and again just being a great part of this community and so I really appreciate her you should all appreciate her too um, she's an extremely hard worker and she takes that to everything she does including including uh, this content here um, so Katarana um, thank you so much for all that you've done and if you have final words on this and you know, where to find you. Yeah, I guess it's just been nice to like be kind of in a, a neurodivergent space where I could honestly just like talk about a lot of uh, the different things that I, I felt because I, I have never really been able to formulate it or just kind of, I, I always feel like I'm inconveniencing my friends. So I try my best to talk more, less and less about myself. Um, so yeah, it was just really nice being able to talk about like some of the insecurities and how that's 
affected um, myself and uh, I, I, it was really nice actually learning uh, more about uh, BPD BPD because I uh, once again uh, it's really one of those uh, quite stigmatized things um, so when I go ahead and uh, you know um, see media about it it's just like and they will stalk you until the end of time and, and they're all crazy and it, it was just really nice to hear like some of the empathetic notes that's something that like you know that's never portrayed in the media like hey do you know i have so much fucking empathy that it hurt <laughs> like that's so cute <laughs> uh yeah so um i'm Colorado. um i'm <laughs> finishing up my thesis um, I've gotten all the other work done. I just need to finish the thesis. Um, I am the president of my university's aerospace society, and I have contributed to rockets, satellites, rovers, and medical research all for space. And I also run my own non for profit for STEM equality um, because, um, yeah, as someone that's definitely winning the, uh, what do you call it, uh, <laughs> the, the oppression Olympics. I still think it's good to help other people that aren't necessarily having all of my issues. I think everybody needs to be into STEM and all of us deserve to be middle class discussing yuppies one day. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's me. And uh, I really hope to be able to actually do my thesis stream this week. And I will be here on Prime's panel tomorrow, whether he likes it or not. By the way, thank you for being like the only person to use the term yuppies I've ever heard in my life. It's like my favorite term, but like I'm pretty sure it's not American enough to use on Prime's stream. Yeah, I, word. I, it, are, are we are we having a Canada moment, guys? Oh my god! Uh, Neurodivergent I, Canada moment. I connect. Woo! I, and I want to know that when I lived in when I lived in a city called Spokane, all like half the people I met were Nazis, and the other half were yuppies. <laughs> All right, so we gotta we gotta be careful about encouraging people wait, to be yuppies. Whoa, whoa, wait! You're a fellow Washingtonian for real? I was briefly, and I will be again soon. Hell yeah! <laughs> when you get here, know. when you get here, you <laughs> motherfucking DM me, and we're gonna hang, okay? We're gonna party. Hell yeah, dude! Yeah, Cascadia. True. <laughs> True. Pacific Northwest gang represent. It's the most beautiful part of the country. It is. It is. It is pog as hell. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, I'm gonna pop off now. Uh, yeah. Prime, thanks so much for having me. Uh, much love to all of you. And anytime y'all want to talk, just hit up my DMs. Y'all are welcome. Seriously. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Uh, to uh, the rest of my panel. Um, yeah, uh, we are gonna go on to open welcome panel right now. Uh, anyone here is welcome to join us. But if not, that's okay. Uh, thank you for spending your time, your energy, um, your uh, knowledge, and your passion with my community. I'm sure they appreciate it just as much as I do. Have a good one, everyone. Bye. Thank you.